Well, good morning and welcome to the first first pre-retirement overview briefing of the year. Uh, my name is Wendy Modis and I am an HR training and development specialist with the Army Benefit Center Civilian. Uh, with me this morning, I have my fellow senior specialist, uh, Ms. Marie Shelton. She will be answering your questions as we move through the briefing. All questions should be made through the Teams chat feature and will be answered in the order that they are received. Um, today, we're going to be briefing only the FERS retirement system and how retirement relates to your federal benefits. It's approximately a three-hour briefing, but we will take a couple, couple of breaks on the hour. Um, additionally, we'd also like to ask that you hold your questions until we reach a particular that particular section of the briefing. We only have one chatter, so it, it cuts down on the repeated answering of questions. Um, many of your questions are probably going to be answered during the actual block of instruction anyway, so if you could do that for us, that helps us out a lot. Um, I will also be sending each attendee the slide deck after the presentation has concluded, as well as a short feedback survey link about the presentation. We do encourage you to complete that survey as it does assist us in gauging how we're doing and is a great way for us to make improvements where needed. Um, we do have a lot to cover today, so without further delay, I'm going to go ahead and just get started. Oops, sorry back there. Okay, um, so during this briefing, we're going to review ways to plan for your retirement um, and the various systems that we use. Um, we'll talk a little bit about civilian deposits and redeposits, as well as military deposits for those of you who are in the military and have military service, um, types of retirement and computations, federal employee health benefits, federal employee group life insurance, the thrift savings plan, uh, flexible spending accounts, the federal dental and vision insurance program, as well as retirement estimates and the retirement process. We'll kind of outline that briefly. Um, so when it comes to your benefits elections, we use the government retirement and benefits platform, or it's called GRB platform. You've probably heard um, a benefit specialist talk about the GRB platform. So GRB, what it does is provides just a customer-friendly benefit system. It's available 24 hours a day, as long as you're using that common access card. Um, as long as you use that, you even from home, it sometimes works with the home CAC reader as well, so you can use it there. Um, GRB is a secure site. It does offer the ability of self-service benefit transaction processing, so you're not having to call and wait in on the phone center line uh, to make a transaction. You can do that on your own. Um, also, it has the convenience of researching useful content at your leisure. There is a resource library within the GRB platform. Um, it also allows you to uh, process or print your benefit forms. So if you, you know, want to print out your FEHB form when you make your election, you can do that as well. That resource library is a really handy tool. So I encourage you, if you have not looked through that, there are a lot of videos, um, articles, things of that nature out there. You can find all of the forms out there as well. So it's a really big wealth of information. If you haven't gone to it, I would go out and kind of look through it on uh, when you have a when you have time. Um, it does offer GRB platform off, also offers those estimate calculators as well as a total compensation statement based upon the employee's service computation date for leave. Why is that important? Um, your service computation date for leave is how we gauge or how the how the government gauges how much leave you get each pay period. That is not your service computation date for retirement. The only time your service computation date for retirement is is compiled is when you ask for a retirement estimate. And that has to be done within five years of your eligible retirement date. So um, just know that that if you use that estimate calculator, that using that service computation date for leave can sometimes skew that um, that estimate calculator a little bit, like what you the answers that you get from it. So if it doesn't look right, it might be that. Um, this is especially important for those who have like military deposits or um, have worked like. Um, what do I want to say, FICA service um, that where you've not had retirement deductions or that kind of thing and you had to buy back that time. So it, it does skew that a little bit. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we get to that section. Um, you can access the GRB platform through the Army Benefits Center website by clicking on the link on the slide. 
Um, it is a live link, so once you have these slides, um, if you don't have them already, if you haven't found them on the website, um, you can use these slide decks to um, access these live links. So, all right, so we're going to look at the Army Benefit Center homepage on the website. The GRB login access icon here is circled in red on this slide. Um, you must also log in again to GRB by using your CAC access. So if you cannot get it to work from a CAC reader at home, it's probably not going to work. You can try it on Google. Google Chrome usually works best with uh, GRB, but if um, you can't get it to work from home, you'll probably have to access it from your work. <clears throat> So employees can also access, we have what's called the EBATS or Employee Benefits Automated Tracking System. Um, you can get this from the Army Benefit Center webpage. What EBATS is, it's a useful tracking tool for all requests made from or made of the Army Benefit Center by the employee. And that access also requires that CAC. Um, the EBATS login icon is circled on in red on this slide. And the next slide we're going to go to will show that um, just kind of a screenshot of what the EBATS record looks like. So it's going to provide all personal information in the upper portion of the screen and your current benefits elections in that second section. So you'll see your retirement plan, whether or not you have FEHB and what your plan code is, what you're contributing to TSP and what your FEGLI is, what you are currently carrying. This changes um, any kind of election you make over a pay period, it will change the next two weeks. Um, so that, that information keeps updated on the pay period. Um, if you look at um, this person specifically, looks like a military deposit was received. So they somebody had mailed in a military deposit. We received that on 831 of 2015. It was not USERA time. There were no issues with it. Otherwise, that'd be noted in the comments. And that it was completed on September 3rd of 2015. So it's a good way to be able to track things if um, if you don't have time to sit on the phone and wait in the queue, um, you can go to eBATS and track those things that you have in-house. And um, those are updated, like I said, every 24 hours they will update. Um, but when you make those changes to your benefits, that's on the pay period. So, all right. So now we're going to go to um, and look a little bit at the website. Um, there is a quick links access in the upper right hand corner of our home screen. It does afford you some fast access to multiple benefits topics. One important one that I always like to reference is the how do I section um, that gives you uh, instructions on how to do like the military deposits, the civilian deposits and redeposits. It takes you step by step through those processes. So it is is a an easy way to complete those um, different things that you ask of the Army Benefit Center. Plus it does have links to the forms as well. Um, there are also many external links you might find useful during your federal career. One of the ones that I always highlight is there are people that retire and buy a new house. They need an employment verification. Under external links here, you'll see employment verification. You'll just click on that. That goes straight to, I believe it's OPM. They um, verify your employment and send you something back. Um, I believe it's electronically. You receive that employment verification so you can you know, apply for your home loans and things of that nature. So those are just a few of the little things that we have to offer with our website. So the Army Benefit Center also offers a call center for your convenience. Um, the system is available Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., except for those federal holidays, of course. It is in the central time zone of the United States. And also, I always like to point out um, any kind of briefing that we give is going to be on central time. I know a lot of you are on the eastern time zone, but it is always going to be the central time zone because um, that's where Fort Riley is and that's where we're out of, we're stationed out of. Um, given we've had many changes to our phone tree in the past year, um, we ask that you visit the ABCC website at the link on the slide here and select the Contact Us tab for your agency-specific contact information. It's changed a little bit and it, it continues to evolve. Um, we're trying to do some new things with the phone system as well, so it will continue to evolve there. But if you select that Contact Us tab there on the home page, um, that it's a little yellow button, you can go in there and find all of the most current information. 
So our overarching goal is to provide you the most efficient and beneficial customer service that you deserve and to complete retirement packets within five working days of your retirement date. We all know that's a perfect world and it doesn't always happen, especially at the end of the year because of the influx of um, requests that we have to retire. We do face many ongoing challenges beyond our control. That is one of them. Um, also, late and past due retirement applications. Um, again, that constant fluctuation in production request. That continues to be a factor beyond our control. We work as hard as we can, but we only have so many specialists all year. And when we get more production requests that come in to retire, it, it creates a backlog. So just know that they're working hard to get that done. They are, are trying to get everything done before the first of the year when you retire on December 31st, but a lot of times that doesn't happen. So just be patient. Please don't work past your, your retirement date that you've requested because that will cause an issue with your pay. Another challenge that we have is the receipt of the unhealthy retirement packet. People ask me, why is it healthy or unhealthy? Um, basically, it's just errors. Um, we receive a lot of packets that have errors or things that are left unsigned, um, unanswered. So there is a benefits administration letter that OPM puts out. It's called 12-103. The Army Benefit Center, um, we have to meet various criteria to ensure the packet is healthy by their standards per this benefits administration letter. Um, before we send it to OPM for final adjudication, everything has to be perfect. Um, many retirement packets um, that we receive, they do arrive with multiple issues, again, requiring correction. That does take some time and communication between the benefit specialist and the employee, sometimes the employees out of office or um, on RDO or on leave, that kind of thing. So there is some back and forth there that needs to happen at times. Um, some of these examples include no required signatures on forms or corrected information. Um, sometimes people use correction fluid or correction tape or they mark out information. Um, OPM requires every document that they receive to be free of error to ensure your retirement elections are what you intend. It's basically a legal document for them. These are what you intend for it to be. They don't want any kind of questions um, after the fact and so those those documents have to be free of error. Uh, military deposit forms, guidelines and processes have changed over time. This kind of creates some difficulty for past military deposits having used verifying information that's no longer accepted per those OPM guidelines. Um, employees do tend to be at a disadvantage because they are unaware of any guideline or form changes, which may cause the need for new and updated information prior to your retirement. So you may have to request that DD-214 that's an, on an updated form um, to give to us so we can give it to OPM. And lastly, um, the Federal Erroneous Retirement Coverage Corrections Act, or FERCA as it's called. Um, this generally occurs when an employee returns to federal service after a break and is placed in the wrong retirement system. This doesn't happen very often, but if it is discovered, all records with erroneous information have to be corrected, which takes a lot of time. So they have to go back to whatever the date was where you were placed in the erroneous um, retirement system and then correct everything and it does like i said it does take time um, being proactive in any of those situations assists us with processing your retirement packet in a more timely manner so um we always like you to know you know what we face on our side um so you're not just sitting there wondering why aren't they processing why what are they having parties are they doing this we're not doing that we are trying to get things done as fast as we can um just a little fun fact we do have approximately 60 fully trained retirement specialists. They process a spectrum of packets such as deposits, redeposits, and those military deposits for over 450,000 civilian personnel, as well as those uh, retirements. As, and so those take a lot of time. Additionally, these are the same specialists who also man the phones as well as the inquiry email boxes. So generally it boils, boils down to budget. However, even if a specialist is hired to help us out in those times where we have increased production, it is a developmental position and it takes a full two years to train new hires. So that it, 
that's all part of the process and all part of the things that we face with those challenges. So we just like to kind of put that out there so you guys know um, we are doing our best and we are we definitely appreciate your patience. So um, the Army Benefit Center has created several social media accounts to connect with you. Um, the ABCC Facebook and X, formerly known as Twitter, those pages allow us to disseminate important information quickly, such as upcoming changes to your benefits, um, notifications of upcoming virtual training events, closures due to weather, which we had one of those today. The phone center is closed today because of inclement weather at Fort Riley and um, scheduled maintenance times or system operational issues that's just to name a few we put a lot of a lot of information out there on a daily basis um, we also have a youtube channel that is currently being updated with just small bites of information that you can access at your own convenience um, given our section is basically me <laughs> I am the training person and I do all of the briefings plus the social media. It does take time to produce those, but I am really excited to be working on such a benef beneficial project for you guys. Um, you can click on the links on the slide to connect with us. That does all of the um, icons there. They do have links so you can actually go and visit or actually I think they're up here. Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. OK, so next we're going to talk about uh, retirement planning. So retirement planning should span your entire career. It is the individual employee's responsibility to keep informed with OPM guidelines that change over time. We know that's not always easy. We do our best to try and put things out, especially using that social media. That's one way we can connect quickly with you and inform you. Um, and better informed employees also tend to make better decisions and should plan for retirement throughout your federal career. Don't just put it on the back burner and say five years from the time I leave, I'm going to start. It's something you need to be involved in your entire federal career. So there are four phases of retirement planning that we highlight. The early career pertains to an employee who is 25 plus years from retirement, so somebody that just came on board. Um, at this phase, you should review and just adjust your benefits on a regular basis. You also want to apply to make any military deposits or civilian deposits to maximize that interest-free period, which we will talk about in the following sections. Mid-career employees have at least 10, but less than 25 years until retirement. During that phase, you should review and adjust your benefits as your life-changing events occur. Um, make that a process of normal occurrence at least every five years during that mid-career phase until your retirement is imminent. And it's most important, it's really the most important part of retirement planning. You've got to kind of, like I said, stretch it out over your federal career, know where you're at. Um, your thrift savings plan contributions, those should be reviewed more often as that TSP portion of your retirement should be the largest portion of your monthly annuity payment in retirement. You'll have three different payments. That should be the largest. Um, late career employees are those less than 10 years from retirement. During that time, you should review and just adjust your benefits. Keep on doing that. Thrift savings plan and deposit contributions, make sure you have those paid to ensure you're on track to retire. Um, there are those calculators in the GRB as well as the federal ballpark estimate calculator at opm.gov and we'll give you that link here in just a moment. Um, employees whose retirement is imminent, you are less than five years from pulling the pin. So an employee in this phase should continue to review and adjust your benefits on an annual basis. As I said, it, it should be done throughout your federal career. Um, just make sure that those benefits are working for you. We can't see what's going on in your life and things happen. So you want to make sure that those are working out for you as you move through your federal career. Um, it's important during the imminent phase to request a retirement estimate from the Army Benefits Center. This is very, very important. This estimate is going to provide you the opportunity for a benefit specialist to perform a comprehensive review of your personnel records as they sit in EOPF. And it assists you in making better informed decisions when it comes to your retirement because it's going to spell out an approximate value on your um, your FERS annuity. So um, that's going to help you kind of plan forward. Am I where I need to be as far as payments each month? Am I, you know, do I need to stay a little longer? Those types of things. 
So at all phases of your career, it is really important to review your electronic personnel folder to determine all records are in your file when it comes time for retirement. Um, you can sign up to do that at, I believe it's www.eopf. No, yes, eopf.gov and then backslash army. And there's a, a place there you can sign up to uh, view your account if you don't have it already. So those retirement planning links, um, these are there to assist you in your retirement planning efforts. We have the Army Benefit Center homepage. We have a whole retirement section there. Um, this is for active employees, obviously. Uh, the federal ballpark estimate information, that is available at the, the um, website listed there underneath that retire tools calculator ballpark. That is really a helpful tool and is something that I strongly encourage you to go out and look into. That site allows you to put in all your funds, such as Social Security, um, your TSP amounts, what an estimated annuity that amount that you have, and any additional money you have coming into you to have a full spectrum of your finances. It kind of gives you a, a bird's eye view of everything that's coming in after you retire. And then the U.S. Financial Literacy Education Commission website has mymoney.gov. This allows you to view information about investing, spending, and protecting your money. So that's helpful during your federal career. New to OPM is the Retirement Process Quick Guide uh, web link. That link is going to take you to a principal guide that provides a better understanding of the OPM retirement process. And that's just the OPM retirement process. There's actually three phases of retirement. ABC has a phase, DFAS has a phase, and OPM has a phase. So this is OPM stating to you what happens on their end. Um, it also provides a processing tracker and some additional information about when to expect your interim and first full annuity payment. It's really, really um, a helpful tool for those who have recently retired or those that are just interested in knowing the process. Finally, Services Online. This is a portal provided by OPM, and that is at servicesonline.opm.gov. Um, this is going to take the place of GRB platform once you retire and you are in, entered into the OPM system. OPM maintains all your personnel records in retirement, and Services Online is your one-stop shop for all your retirement benefits, financial needs all of that it's all centered in that services online so it's kind of nice to have that one place you go for everything instead of 15 different websites like we do when we're federal employees so the federal employee retirement system or FERS this has three separate levels and we're just going to talk FERS today this is based upon the the levels are based upon when you were hired in a covered position as a FERS employee, just straight FERS, you must have been hired in a covered position between January 1st, 1987 and prior to January 1st, 2013. These employees contribute 0.8% of their salary to the FERS retirement system every pay period. Um, FERS revised annuity employees or FERS Ray. These are first hired in, uh, employees first hired in a covered position on January 1st, 2013. And prior to January 1st, 2014, just one year for those FERS Ray uh, employees, that group of employees pays 3.1% of their salary to the FERS retirement system each pay period. And then lastly, you have the FERS Further Revised Annuity Employees, or FERS Fray. These employees were first hired in a covered position on or after January 1st, 2014. Um, these employees contribute 4.4% of their salary to the FERS retirement system each pay period. And you can determine which FERS category you're in by reviewing Block 30 of your appointment SF-50. In your electronic personnel file, you can also go to eBATS on our website. You can click on the eBATS icon. It is also listed there as well. So an employee who contributes to the FERS retirement system also contributes to Social Security. Um, new and rehired FERS employees are automatically enrolled to contribute 5% to their respective thrift savings plan as of October 1st, 2020. So once you are enrolled in that, or you're actually enrolled in that to begin with, and that 5% is what you're automatically enrolled in. Doesn't mean you can't change it. You can lower it 
raise it, whatever you need to do. But um, that's what is automatically done at the time you are hired on. New employees are automatically enrolled in the Thrift Savings Plan lifecycle funds that are listed here on the slide. And each of those funds is determined according to your birth year and the year of your expected retirement. And you can read more about those um, lifecycle funds on the TSP.gov website. They are um, explained a little bit more in depth as to what each fund is and what it, you know, what the individual funds are, what they invest in, what they're based on, what what market they're based on, or you know, Dow Jones Industrial. Well, I'm not a financial whiz by any means, so um, if you want more. Um, information about that life cycle fund or up the individual funds themselves, TSP.gov is the place to go. So as a FERS employee, you are eligible to contribute up to the IRS mandated cap to your thrift savings plan. You're going to receive 5% matching contributions from the federal government every pay period if you contribute at least 5% of your salary. So you're automatically enrolled in 5%. And if you stay there, the government's going to give you, um, they're going to match that contribution 5%. You automatically receive 1% of your salary going to the TSP regardless of your contribution election. There's always that 1% that goes to your TSP. And that's, that's non-negotiable. That has to be in there. You must be employed with the federal government for at least three years to become vested. And then the first 3% of your elected contributions are matched on that 5% matching. They're matched dollar for dollar with the remaining 2% matched at 50 cents on the dollar. And you can find more information um, at our website there. These are direct links, so you can go to our website or you can go to the TSP.gov website. There is a contributions limits um, section and that will take you directly there. So we're going to talk a little bit. I know we said we're going to stick with FERS, but we're going to talk a little bit about CSRS interim because this can impact um, certain people that uh, didn't switch over to FERS and are perhaps interested. So the Civil Service Retirement System or CSRS, this interim is the retirement system for employees who are first hired on or after January 1st, 1984, and certain employees who, who left the federal service and then came back and were rehired. Um, employees who fall under CSRS interim, they plan <clears throat> this plan contributes 1.3% of their salary into the retirement fund, as well as contributing to Social Security. They were the first CSRS group that began contributing to Social Security, because if you're straight CSRS, you know you're not contributing to Social Security. On January 1st, 1987, employees who had at least five years of potentially creditable civilian service were changed to the CSRS offset system. So January 1st, 1987, they love their dates and you'll hear them all throughout this briefing. Um, if you had at least five years of civilian service under CSRS, um, you're changed over to that CSRS offset system. This is the transition over to FERS. Um, those employees with less than five years of potentially creditable service under, like, say, CSRS, they were changed over to the FERS retirement system if it was less than five years that they had. So that's where the interim comes in. Now we have the component. So if you are currently a FERS employee but have civilian service prior to your election of FERS and the service was actually subject to CSRS retirement deductions or it was subject to Social Security deductions but not both, and then the total of those two types of services, five or more years, you have what's called a CSRS component. Um, this portion of your retirement annuity, civilian or military deposit or redeposit, that's going to be calculated using CSRS guidelines. So it will vary a little bit for those who have that component. So the FERS retirement system is a three-tiered system. We did talk a little bit about that with your FERS annuity being the smallest portion in most cases. So that FERS annuity that we talk about in the estimates, that is what we're talking about, that pension. That is going to be the smallest portion of, of what makes up your retirement. 
Next comes your social security payment. That's generally the second level tier, like the middle of the road uh, amount that is paid out to you. Those who retire at their minimum retirement age with at least 30 years or their age 60 with at least 20 years of service, which will be me, I'm so excited, um, will receive the FERS annuity supplement until they are age 62 at which time you're eligible to apply for social security benefits because you're not quite there yet at age 60. So you kind of have this, this FERS annuity supplement that comes in and it bridges that gap to social security and pays you an additional amount of money. It's a nice perk um, if you have, especially if you're um, retiring at minimum retirement age with the, at least 30 years, that's a great thing to be able to receive. Um, lastly, we wanna talk about the thrift savings plan and how that is part of the retirement makeup. Um, this is expected to make up the largest portion of your total retirement because it is managed by you, the employee, throughout your federal career. You have the option on whether or not to put money into it or whether to take that money home with you. So um, that's why they make that the largest uh, or the largest part of that first pyramid. So if you have any questions on that, please list them in the chat. Some people don't understand that it's divided up, but FERS is three tiers. So you have your FERS annuity pension, smallest amount, Social Security or FERS annuity supplement. And we'll talk a little bit more about the FERS annuity supplement. Um, that is the middle amount. And then the thrift savings plan should make up the largest amount of your retirement. So there are several service computation dates or SCDs within the federal system. One of these is the retirement service computation date, which is used to determine retirement eligibility, as well as calculate your retirement annuity or pension. Um, the retirement SCD, this can differ from your SCD for leave purposes, like we talked about before. That SCD for leave, that appears on your biweekly leave and earnings statement. It also appears in block 31 of your SF-50, but not all service that is creditable for leave is creditable for retirement. A good example of this is those who served in non-covered positions where they weren't paying into a retirement system, such as like temporary appointments where they were only paying into FICA. Um, this will not have time credited toward their SCD unless they're eligible to make a deposit for that time and they've completed that deposit. So that's where that, when you use that SCD calculator in GRB, that's where that might be skewed a little bit. If you have those instances of temporary appointments, non-cover positions, military deposits, those, those types of things. Um, the retirement SCD, unfortunately, is only available through a retirement estimate request completed by the Army Benefit Center. That's why we make it so important to request that estimate when you get to be five years out. It just gives you not only a planning tool, but it also gives you that retirement SCD. And that is derived, again, from your EOPF. So examples of service creditable for leave, but not for retirement. These are non-appropriated fund or NAF service that was based on a temporary appointment with NAF. Um, retired military campaign or combat service at that retired military pay is not waived. Um, so you'll have campaign or combat service time. You get uh, credit for your leave on the military side and the civilian side, but you will not get it. You will not get that for, it'll just be for your SCD for leave. It won't be for your SCD for retirement because you retired from the military. They keep those two things separate. Um, so um, let's see, do, 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 do. Um, eligible civilian or military service for which a deposit hasn't been paid. Um, that's another one in the non-deduction service performed on or after January 1st, 1989. That is not eligible for deposit. So it is, is going to be um, not eligible for your retirement SCD as well. So now we're gonna take some time and talk a little bit about the civilian deposit and redeposit process. Um, typically we have the military deposits first, but we're gonna go ahead and do civilian deposits um, first and then we'll go military deposits and then we'll take a quick break. Um, so if after this you don't have military service, you can take a quick break and we'll post in the um, Q&A chat when we're gonna return. Um, so you're go grab a cup of coffee and stretch your legs and take a break from all this crazy stuff we're talking about. Okay, so deposit basics. So 
A deposit service, what it allows you to do is to make a deposit on any period of potentially creditable service where retirement deductions have not been withheld. And we talked a little bit about that just a little bit ago. Um, some of those service times where you were just paying into FICA, like temporary appointments or summer hire appointments, those types of things. Um, you, you generally were not paying into a retirement system, so you have to make those um, you have to make that deposit into the retirement system in order to be able to be credited for that. These generally include non-career time, such as you know, a temporary appointment or intermittent service. The FICA tax is the only deduction being withheld. And again, it's called non-deduction service. There is one other way um, you can make a deposit due to a change in law. Uh, Federal Civilian Service under Peace Corps or VISTA service can now be bought back through the deposit process with the proper documentation, and that time will be added to your annuity computation once the deposit is paid in full. So you'll receive credit for that um, for your retirement if you make that deposit. So that is kind of nice if you have those um, two types of service. The amount of your deposit, um, that civilian deposit, is going to be 1.3% of your earnings during that non-deduction service period, plus a variable interest amount, which 3% um, of your Peace Corps or VISTA stipend, that's where that ends up. Um, let's see, CSRS guidelines, again, are going to apply if you have that component, that CSRS component to your federal civilian service. And those with only FERS contributions will fall under FERS guidelines. So only those FERS rules will apply if you have no component. Deposit service only allows the purchase of non-deduction service, which occurred prior to January 1st, 1989. So if a deposit is made, you will receive credit for the length of service towards your eligibility. I always call it the time and money. So eligibility is your time to retire as well as credit for your annuity computation and the annuity computation is your money. So um, you'll receive credit for both of those. If you choose not to make that deposit for your non-deduction service, you will not receive credit toward either. So you will not receive credit towards your retirement eligibility and you will not receive credit toward um, your annuity computation as well, time and money. A deposit is not allowed for any non-deduction service again completed on or after January 1st, 1989. No retirement service credit will be added to your retirement SCD or annuity computation for any of those non-deduction periods if they occurred after that date. So redeposit. Um, redeposit service occurs when a sum of money is, say you've been paying into retirement system as an active federal employee or even a survivor. If you've uh, had a federal employee who's a spouse that passed away and you're a survivor and you pay that money in to the retirement system to cover a period of service for which de retirement deductions were once withheld and then later refunded. Um, so for example, you decide to leave federal service after working five to 10 years and take a job in the private sector and you take a refund of all those retirement contributions that you paid into the retirement system when you leave federal service. You receive that refund, maybe rolled it over into the new places, the new jobs, uh, 401k, something of that nature, or you spent it on a vacation, whatever you choose to do. So you receive the refund and now you decide you're gonna go back to the federal government after a few years because it's more lucrative and you want to be able to count your that previous time towards your retirement eligibility and your annuity. So the cost of redeposit service is going to be the amount of the refund you took plus a variable interest amount. Again, we're gonna apply those CSRS guidelines um, if you have that CSRS component to your federal civilian service, but now fall under the FERS retirement system. If you're straight FERS and that's what you've been under, then only FERS guidelines will apply. So there's just a little flow chart here. If you took a refund of your FERS retirement contributions after you left federal service, um, you have a choice on whether you wish to make a redeposit if you decide to return. So if that redeposit is made, service credit for those refunded periods are added to the retirement SCD or your eligibility, as well as your annuity computation, because you're putting that money back into the retirement system that you took out when you left. 
If you choose not to make that redeposit, your service credit will be used for your retirement eligibility for the time part only, but it will not be used in the annuity computation because you did actually work that time. You just took the money that you put into the retirement system for that time, so it won't be added to the, the annuity computation, but it will be given to you for your retirement eligibility. So to make a deposit or redeposit for service credit, you're going to need to complete the standard form 3108. Um, this is on our website. Again, there's a how do I section. You can go to there and find that form and all of the steps that you need to take to do the civilian deposit or redeposit. Um, please ensure you sign the form and send the original form to us at the Army Benefits Center. Unless you're sending it electronically and you sign it with your CAC uh, certificate, then you can send it by email or um, upload it. I believe, I don't know if you can send it to the inquiry box or not. I, I'm not, I'm not sure. And I don't know that I'd want to do that because it has PII, but um, you can, I believe, upload it to the GRB and or mail that to us. You can mail it to us as well or fax it to our um, fax number. We have all those listed at the contact us. I have to clarify that just to make sure, but I know that when you sign with your CAC certificate and it produces like a copy, we can send that because that's a, that is a designated certificate assigned to you. Now, if you sign in ink, it must be the original copy that you send to us at the Army Benefits Center. Um, it's important to send that original form because OPM is not going to process a deposit request with a copied signature or any type of correction made on the original form. Um, they're going to be taking money from you, so they want to make sure that it is from you and um, that you are aware that that's going to happen. So Army Benefit Center, we will calculate an estimate deposit or redeposit amount and forward that to OPM. They are then going to finalize that request and notify you of the final deposit or redeposit amount and the various payment methods you have. That process can take up to one year to complete, so it's really important to plan for this prior to retirement. In fact, it's better to do it when you first get into your federal service because you have a three-year um, grace period on your interest, so you want to make sure you take advantage of that. But after you've paid your deposit or redeposits paid in full, please request the payment in full statement from OPM and have that uploaded to your electronic personnel folder. It's going to be more of a like a deposit statement just showing a zero balance. Um, so that is something to be aware of. Uh, for more information about that process, again, you can visit our website under the resources section and look for the how do I section. It will give you everything you need to know. Some employees will submit a request to pay a deposit or redeposit and then just choose not to complete it or forget about it. Um, if you've already submitted a civilian deposit or redeposit request and have a change of mind, you decide you want to pay for it now, you can email scbillings at opm.gov to find out how much you will need to pay to complete that deposit or redeposit. They'll do a recalculation for you uh, based on how much time it's been since they did the last deposit. Additionally, if you've paid that civilian deposit or redeposit, you will need to email screceipts at opm.gov for proof your civilian deposit or redeposit has been paid in full. Um, they will send you the statement generally, but if you don't if you don't receive it for some reason, you can always email screceipts at opm.gov. They can get that for you. Um, for either request, they ask that you include your civilian service deposit or claim number. That is included on the original letter you received from OPM regarding how much you are asked to pay for that deposit. So if you don't have it, that's fine. They can still find it by your social, but um, if you do have it, it just kind of expedites things a little bit. All right, so military deposits. If you did not have military service, this is going to take me about probably 10 minutes to get through, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break. So you have, we'll probably be back about, hmm, We'll be back about nine o'clock, um, but check back in the chat. We'll list when we're going to return and uh, go go grab yourself a cup of coffee again or take a take a break and stretch your legs, whatever you need to do. We're going to go into military deposits. 
So there are different types of service you can have while in the military. The first type is Title 10 service, which is service called on by the President of the United States. This type of service is paid for by the federal government and is considered active duty military time and can be performed also by Reserve Corps and National Guard. So um, if the president calls up the Reserve and National Guard, then that's Title 10 service. Regardless of how you served um, through the Reserve, National Guard, or your active duty, a deposit can be made for honorable Title 10 service. On the flip side, there is another type of service called Title 32 service. This type of service is called on by a state governor and is paid for by the state. Generally, this is National Guard soldiers fall under this service title. Um, a lot of times it'll be like tornado relief or hurricane relief or stuff, stuff of that nature um, when the National Guard is called up to help out. That type of service may be bought back and credited towards your retirement, but it must be completed under USERA law, which is Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. Um, USERA law just basically means your military service interrupted your federal civilian service. So you were a federal civilian employee and you got orders to be called up to go help with tornado relief. Um, if you're close to the Gulf Coast, you know we had a lot of those last night. That's where I'm at and I've been up all night long. So <laughs> I apologize, I'm probably a little wired this morning. I had uh, had some caffeine and, and, and feel great. So, um, but that USERA law, that's very important if you're going to pay for that Title 32 service uh, military deposit. Um, it has to fall under that USERA law. Again, it means that your military service just interrupts your federal civilian service. You go serve your military service and you come back to your federal civilian position. To buy back your military time, you must have a DD-214 copy with character of service and any lost time listed, um, generally the member four copy or the long form copy. You may also have a statement of service and a copy of your certified military orders that state your time was honorable. Um, there is a, a template that you can use for that statement of service that we have. You can ask someone for that. You can email me. And, and if you have questions after this, you can always email me. Um, Wendy Modest is my name, and I am the only Modest in global. Um, whatever proof of service you have, it must meet five criteria, your rank, type, or title of service, your character of discharge, your any lost time you might have, and then the beginning and end dates of your service period. Additional information about that process can be found again in that how do I resources section of our website that is so, so helpful. So military retired pay. If you are in receipt of military retired pay and you performed your military time in a non-combat situation, no credit from your, for your military pay can be received unless you waive that military retirement pay altogether and a deposit, a deposit is made to buy back that time. 99.9% .9 of the time, people are like, you've got to be kidding me. The military retirement is so much more um, profitable to keep, but there are um, times when, say, you, you had to retire at a lesser um, rank, like E5, E6, um, with, with less time, and maybe your military retired pay isn't that great, but you are now working in the six figures on the civilian side. So it might benefit that person to look into paying that military deposit. However, if you are a military combat-related disability due to an instrumentality of war, which means you were injured in combat, or you fall under Chapter 1223 or Title 10 Reserve Service, these are my Miltex, um, you must pay a deposit to receive credit for civilian retirement and annuity computation, but it does not require you to waive that military retired pay. So again, military combat related disabilities due to an instrumentality of war, if you have that uh, permanent disability retirement letter or temporary disability retirement letter, um, or you fall under Chapter 1223, which is reserve, uh, if you're retired reserve, or Title 10 reserve service, which is those mil or those Miltex, um, you have to pay that deposit to receive credit for that active time. 
for civilian retirement and towards your annuity computation, but it does not require you to waive your military retired pay. So it's a little different in those instances. So if you served in the military on or after January 1st, 1957, you have to make a deposit to receive credit towards your civilian retirement and annuity computation. The amount of the deposit is calculated as 3% of your basic pay during the military service period. That amount does include interest. However, the first two years are interest free. That's when you're making that deposit. That's that interest free grace period. On day one of the third year, interest begins to accrue, providing a two year and 364 day window to buy back your time without paying any interest. So as an employee, the earlier you buy back your military time after your initial appointment, the better it is. This slide just kind of takes a closer look at that USERA law we talked about. Again, USERA is when your military service interrupts your federal civilian service with a call to an active duty military status. Once again, Title 10 and Title 32 service can be bought under USERA law. You will receive credit for your retirement eligibility and annuity computation only if you make that deposit for your USERA time. So if you were a uh, federal civilian, you had military service that interrupted it and you returned to federal service after or federal civilian service after that, you went back to your same job you still need to make a deposit for that USERA time in order for it to be counted towards your time and money on the uh, retirement SCD. So the amount of your military deposit under USERA is going to be the lesser of two amounts. It's either going to be 3% of that basic pay earned while you're on active duty plus some interest, or what you would have contributed to your first retirement had you been employed as a federal civilian plus interest. So the lesser of either of those. Um, the amount of interest is going to be based upon a variable interest rate. It changes every year. Currently it's 1.8750. Again, the first two years are interest free with that third year interest deferred. So you do have an option there. Um, if you're interested in making that military deposit, it is a five step process. It does take some time. There are a couple of moving pieces in there and a couple different um, agencies that are involved. Um, it's just a basic step by step overview of the process in the um, how do I section again of our website. However, um, this is actually just the basic, but you can go to um, the Army Benefits Civilian website at the link there on the slide and that basic step by step overview of the process. It's detailed. It, it can be found on our website at the link on the slide. It contains all the links to the forms that you'll need to complete that buyback process as well as specific instructions. Um, one of the biggest things to remember is all military deposits must be made prior to separation. Uh, submitting a military deposit does not mandate you to pay that deposit. So you can actually request to pay the military deposit. You get the information back and you decide, no, nope, I'm not doing that. You don't have to. It does not lock you into it. So that's um, important information for those that are interested, important things that you need to know. So a military period of service includes consecutive periods of active duty service where there is no break, but does not include any lost time during that same military period. Uh, for more, more military, yeah, excuse me, for military purposes, even a one day break in active duty service constitutes two separate periods. So any military service completed prior to starting as a civilian employee must be Title 10 service in order to be uh, creditable or eligible for buyback. So hypothetically speaking, say your DD-214 states you have current service of maybe five years, two months, and 29 days, and then right under that it says prior service of three years, seven months, and two days. Uh, to buy back that prior service, you are required to submit a separate DD-214 for that prior service. We have to know all of the character of discharge, any lost time, anything that happened during that prior service, and that's why they request that separate DD-214. Additionally, all military service, again, has to be under honorable conditions. Another common issue we face is missing Form 50s, uh, SF-50s. 
Placing an employee on leave without pay or LWAP US when you go on those USERA time periods and then another one that returns him or her to duty after the active duty military period. Um, we have to know when the employee actually departed his federal position or federal civilian position and then returned to civilian service in order to determine the correct amount for the military deposit. Um, it is always important that you determine the correct period of USERA service on the RI 20-97, which is to request your estimated earnings. And again, check that um, paid in full letter when you receive it from DFAS. Make sure that those military periods are what they should be. Always remember to request that paid in full letter after the deposit is made, as well as have the letter uploaded to your electronic personnel folder after you verify your deposit dates are correct. Acceptable DD-214s. The one thing that makes that DD-214 you submit acceptable in OPM's eyes, which is all that really matters, is the character of discharge and lost time block um, stated on that DD-214, the long form. And it's also commonly known as the member four copy. Um, some DD-214s prior to the 1990s may have had this information listed on the short form, but most after 1990 do not. Um, if you have a member one copy only without the character of discharge and time lost data fields, or it says working copy across your DD-214, um, those will not be accepted by OPM to uh, verify your military service. You will have to have that. It's either a service to member four, and I think there are a couple other copies as well. I'm going to give a class on this um, on the 25th of this month at 11 o'clock. So um, our website will have that information soon, and you can also watch our social media pages. We'll put the links out there as well. Um, how to request DD-214s and paid in full letters. This is something that is a popular topic that people ask about when they call in. So we want to get that information out there and hopefully um, help you guys out before you get to that time where you absolutely have to have it. So noted here is an example of an unacceptable DD-214 and these are in certain files. I did have one. Um, what makes this one um, incorrect um, is the we're looking at um, two different copies really the member four and the member one um, some people have these and this is what was given to them and I, I completely understand that however they did correct those and they they made a service two copy that's just a long form and it doesn't have the member one on it the reason why they won't accept these is that I could say I had a dishonorable discharge and I had a member one copy. I could find my battle buddy's uh, member four copy and he had an honorable discharge. And so I just lay my member one over his member four and it makes it look like I got out honorably. Um, and then I'm eligible to buy that back towards retirement. So they were finding some fraud with that. And so that's why they decided not to accept these anymore. So this is an OPM requirement. Um, they just will not accept them. So again, I'm having that class on the 25th at 11. Um, I will post the link on Facebook, Twitter. Um, we're going, we're trying to get it put out on uh, the website. We've had some issues in weather, inclement weather, that type of thing. Um, it's It was tough to work from home where, uh, where the functional support people were concerned. So um, we're trying to get all of that done. But again, I'll try and put it out on social media in the next week or so. And that way, maybe you can um, attend if you have those issues and need to um, look for that long form DD-214. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to hammer through this. Um, this is a sample amount due letter from DFAS. So once the military buyback information has been finalized by DFAS, you're going to receive what looks like this, a copy of this letter in the mail. It may be a little more updated. This one's kind of old. Um, but what this does is it explains the amount you owe for the deposit and various methods in which you might pay um, your deposit. For example, this, <clears throat> this form states the initial active duty date. <coughs> Excuse me. Those are all highlighted. Um, the deposit amount, the service periods for what you're paying. Um, please make sure you verify those dates are correct when you receive this letter to ensure that you're paying the correct deposit amount. Um, if there is a discrepancy or you see a discrepancy, please contact DFAS directly, or you can reach out to us at the Army Benefit Center, um, uh, give us a call in the phone center to verify that information. We can try and help you out with that as well. 
So how do you know that your military deposit has been paid in full if you've been paying on it over time? Um, you will need to check your biweekly LES in block 20. Um, once DFAS processes your packet, that LES is going to keep track of what you paid and what you still owe, similar to what's, uh, it'll, it'll look similar to this screenshot here. So once your LES reflects there is no balance due, similar to the previous slide, you must obtain what's called a paid in full letter or what we call a PIF letter. Sometimes we'll say that we don't generally, we try not to because it doesn't tell you what that is but it's a paid in full letter. DFAS is currently changing the way these are delivered based upon the date your military deposit became paid in full. So if you were paid in full on or after March 1st of 2023, you will automatically receive a DFAS smart doc um, to the email that is on file with DFAS, which will instruct you on how to download your paid in full letter. Now, if you were paid in full prior to March 1st, 2023, you will need to see your agency's customer service representative to DFAS or your agency timekeeper to issue what is called a remedy ticket to DFAS to request that paid in full letter. It's going to be mailed to your address on file within 45 days of the remedy ticket receipt. Generally, that's that's a perfect scenario. So um, this is all coming from DFAS. So this is something we can't manage on our side, but generally it's about 30 to 45 days. Whatever method you use to re retrieve that PIF letter, please, please, please remember to verify all information contained um, within the letter, especially those dates of service for which you paid. Uh, mistakes, uh, those can be made real easily and will need to be rectified prior to retirement to ensure that correct deposit amount has been paid and that correct amount of time is actually credited. Once your military buyback is paid in full, Again, request that paid in full letter. This is what that uh, looks like. This is an older version, obviously 2019, um, but it'll look something like this. Once received, really important to verify those service periods again, and then request that letter be uploaded to your electronic personnel folder. This is going to help us immensely when it comes time to retire because it gives us the go ahead that yes, you've paid that military deposit and we can credit that towards your retirement. It's also important to note if you paid for military service in the 1990s and early 2000s, you would receive what's called a standard form 3100 or it looks like a pay record from DFAS. This document is completed by DFAS and it's sent to the employee showing payment for a military deposit paid in full. A copy of that form will also be forwarded to OPM for your retirement record if applicable. Um, both that paid in full letter and that standard form 3100, if you have that one, that, those are both uh, acceptable forms of proof of payment. So um, know if you have that in your file, your EOPF, we can use that as well. And we have hit the nine o'clock mark, 902, I believe. We, for those of you that took a, uh, took a 20 minute break. We're going to take another 10 minutes because we haven't breaked yet. So um, take a 10 minute break. We will come back at 912.
OK, hopefully everybody was able to take a, a break. I know it was probably long for some, but um, we're going to go ahead and start with a comprehensive look at retirement under the FERS system. So um, currently there are five types of retirements within the FERS system that are recognized by Department of Army. Um, the optional or voluntary retirement is also called an immediate retirement or immediate annuity. Um, you'll hear it called sometimes. So that occurs when you voluntarily elect to retire. You just send in the application. That's where optional or voluntary and it's and you're eligible, of course. Um, voluntary early retirement authority or VERA. And then there is a discontinued service retirement or DSR as it's sometimes called. These are both types of retirements that are offered solely by your command. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about each one of these in depth. Um, deferred retirement allows you to leave federal service early and defer your retirement until age 62. And the federal government also offers its employees the ability to retire under a disability retirement as well. To retire, you must meet general eligibility requirements, um, which that includes having at least five years of creditable civilian service with the federal government. You must also meet the minimum requirement age or MRA, and you must separate from a position that is subject to retirement coverage. So you're either covered under CSRS or FERS. Next, we're going to look at those various retirement options a bit more in detail. Uh, first up is the optional retirement, also known as um, immediate or voluntary retirement. Um, optional retirement does require you to meet one of three sets of eligibility criteria. The first one, you have to meet that minimum retirement age and have at least 30 years of creditable service. Um, the second one, you must be 60 years of age with at least 20 years of creditable service. Or the last one, you can be 62 years of age with just five years of creditable service. Um, another way you may retire under an optional retirement is to meet your MRA or minimum retirement age with at least 10 years of creditable civilian service, but not more than 30 years. Um, this is commonly known as MRA plus 10 retirement, and it is considered a voluntary type of retirement. There are two noted differences with the MRA plus 10 option. Um, you will receive a 5% reduction for each year you are under the age of 62. Um, for example, if you're like me, my MRA is 57 years of age. Um, this would result in a 25% reduction of your overall gross annuity amount each month, and that's a permanent reduction. Um, so it you are not entitled to the FERS annuity supplement as well. Um, that will be covered in the following slides. A voluntary retirement annuity does accrue on the first day of the following month of your retirement date, um, making the best day to retire for a FERS employee the last day of the month. Um, this way, your annuity does begin accruing in that very next day. So if you go out on the 31st, you start the first and there's no, um, otherwise you have to wait another month, another 30 days to start. So um, you do not have any unpaid days in between your date of separation and the date your annuity begins begins to accrue. So with the MRA plus 10 option, um, you can also do what's called postponing your retirement. Um, if you have reached your minimum retirement age, you have at least 10 years of creditable federal civilian service, and you do not need the retirement benefits right away, you can do what is called postponing your retirement to reduce or eliminate that age reduction penalty. Um, additionally, your federal health benefits and life insurance benefit may be reinstated on your retirement date if you are eligible to continue that coverage at the time you separated. Um, and then any sick leave is also creditable in the computation of your annuity. Um, to take advantage of a postponed retirement, you must elect to retire the first day of any month following your separation up to and then including the second day before you turn 62. So um, just know if you're looking at that postponed retirement, it is out there and it is available to you. We are going to cover the MRA chart. Somebody had a, com uh, a question about this during the break about the uh, minimum retirement ages. This is the chart that OPM puts out. And it is based upon your year of birth, 
For example, if you're born in 1954, you must be at least 56 years of age to retire. If you're like me, born in 1970 or after, the MRA for your retirement is 57 years of age. This is also available on the OPM.gov website. You can just type in MRA or minimum retirement age and it will bring the chart up and it will also tell you a bunch of details about the MRA retirement. So the VERA retirement, her voluntary early retirement authority. This is an early retirement opportunity, again, offered by your command. Uh, most of the time, these can be combined with a voluntary separation incentive payment, or it's sometimes called a VSIP, which is an additional payment of up to $25,000 to retire early. Um, generally, this type of retirement is offered because of agency downsizing or restructuring to decrease the number of employees within that agency. Um, there are several criteria you need to meet to accept or even qualify for a Vera VSIP retirement. Um, you have to be at least 50 years of age with at least 20 or more years of service, or you can be any age if you have at least 25 years of service. Again, your command or installation must approve the Vera and or VSIP. Um, the Army Benefit Center does not have the ability to approve or submit for that type of retirement. One benefit to that opportunity for FERS recipients is there's no age reduction penalty under FERS. Um, however, if you do have that CSRS component we keep talking about, the CSRS portion of your annuity is going to be reduced by 2% each full year you are under the age of 55. So know that you do get penalized if you do have that CSRS component. You will also receive the FERS annuity supplement if you retire at or after your MRA. Um, if you are not currently meeting your minimum retirement age, you will receive the annuity supplement once you do meet your minimum retirement age. Um, your retirement under this authority must also include at least five years of creditable civilian service. Discontinued service retirement, um, also known as DSR. This differs slightly from a voluntary early retirement in its rules and guidelines. Um, with the DSR, your command discontinues your service or your agency discontinues your service, and your annuity is going to commence on the day following your separation if you meet the eligibility requirements to take the DSR. Um, like the VERA option, the DSR requires you to be at least 50 years of age with at least 20 or more years of service, or again, any age with at least 25 years of service. Once your command or agency approves the DSR, the uh, command must provide a specific written notice of proposed involuntary separation, and it will include a, <coughs> excuse me, it will include a packet. Um, it will have that letter in it, that notice, but it will also have um, some additional documentation uh, with it. You will need to provide that information to the Army Benefits Center with your retirement packet. Um, again, like the VERA, there is no age reduction under FERS for early retirement. However, if you have that CSRS component, they're going to get you again. Uh, the CSRS portion of your annuity will be reduced 2% for each full year you're under the age of 55. Your annuity will begin the day after you separate and you will receive an annuity supplement um, if you retire at or after your MRA. Um, if you have not yet reached that MRA, you will receive that annuity supplement once you do. Under that DSR retirement, um, you are not eligible for a VSIP or any type of severance pay. So just know the DSRs are typ uh, typically used um, with people who are aging out of, say, you're retiring from reserve status and you're a MILTEC. Um, Basically, you're losing that ability to maintain that reserve status, and so they have to um, retire you somehow. So the DSRs are used in that situation a lot. So leaving federal service before becoming eligible for an immediate annuity, this is known as deferred retirement. You may receive a deferred annuity at age 62 with at least five years of service or at your MRA with at least 10 years of service. Um, if you apply for that deferred annuity at your MRA, again, there's going to be that 5% reduction, that age penalty reduction for each year you're under the age of 62. 
If you are not eligible for an immediate annuity within one month of your separation, you may defer your retirement. So that applies to anybody that um, is not eligible for that immediate annuity or, or voluntary retirement. Um, additionally, you must meet the required minimum of five years of creditable civilian service at the time you separate, and you must not have taken any kind of refund of your retirement contributions when you separate. Um, the one important difference with the deferred retirement is your federal health benefits and life insurance is not going to be reinstated at the time your annuity commences, and you are not eligible for the FERS annuity supplement. Um, to apply for that retirement, if that's something you're thinking about, Simply, um, what you do is you resign your position, um, just like you normally would, just like you're given a two-week notice. Um, resign your position with your agency, and then when you when you reach the age where you can finally collect on the annuity, um, what you do is you apply directly to OPM. There is a retirement application that can be found on our website and you apply directly to OPM. There's an address listed in the information of that form. So um, it's the first thing that's on the form in the information section. So um, that's where you will apply because you are separated. All of your records go to OPM and then they will process your retirement. <coughs> Pardon me. OK, so while deferred and postponed retirement appear to be almost the same, there are two main differences. And we always get this question, so we kind of want to cover this with everybody. Um, with a postponed retirement, the employee is going to meet their minimum retirement age and has that 10 years of creditable civilian service in the first covered position. While that age reduction penalty applies before age 62, you can postpone your retirement until age 62. You go ahead and leave federal service, but you don't apply for retirement to receive the annuity until age 62 if you meet the postponed eligibility requirements and avoid that age reduction penalty. Additionally, if you're eligible, you can continue the health benefit and life insurance benefits when you finally do retire. Um, on the flip side, you have deferred retirement. That does not allow you to continue benefits, but may be taken with only five years of federal civilian service in a covered position. Um, both options require you to leave your first contributions in the system and are not available if you take a refund of your retirement contributions. FERS annuity supplement, um, what is it? People don't really understand this and just know it, it's not, it doesn't happen for everyone, but um, we try to explain it so you do understand when it does apply to you. Um, the FERS annuity supplement basically is an estimated amount of your Social Security benefits that you earned during your FERS service only. And why it was created was to bridge that gap between when you retire, um, like say you meet your minimum retirement age and you have 30 years of retire or 30 years of service you can go ahead and retire at 57 but you're not going to collect social security probably 62 65 um, so they want to bridge that gap with an extra um, supplement for you between when you retire and when you're actually eligible to apply for social security at age 62. So that benefit is going to be paid to FERS employees who meet eligibility for that optional retirement prior to age 62 and are entitled to an unreduced annuity, which just means you're entitled to a retirement annuity. The supplement is payable through the earlier of either the last day of the month you become 62 years of age or the last day of the month before the first month you're entitled to Social Security benefits. So once you're entitled to Social Security benefits, that FERS annuity supplement is going to stop. And those can be, if you've worked a long time, that can be a good chunk of money that's extra to you if you are going out at your minimum retirement age with, say, 13 years. So to be eligible for that FERS annuity supplement, you must have at least one calendar year of FERS service, and you must retire with an immediate annuity, which just means that you're eligible for retirement. If you are receiving a VERA, that Voluntary Early Retirement Authority, or the Discontinued Service Retirement Option, you have to meet your minimum retirement age. 
Um, those employees who fall under special retirement provisions, such as firefighters, um, law enforcement officers, or air traffic controllers, these uh, individuals are eligible for the FERS annuity supplement immediately. Um, if you retire under a disability, an MRA plus 10, your minimum retirement age plus the 10 years, the deferred option, or you're retiring at age 62 or older, you are not eligible for that FERS annuity supplement. Additionally, the CSRS employees are also not eligible for the annuity supplement because they did not pay into Social Security. So um, that makes a difference there. There is an earnings test um, that FERS annuity supplement is tested each year for earnings above a Social Security exemption amount. Um, the cap is updated annually and is based upon inflation and various government guidelines that come down. Um, once you meet the cap on earnings, say you're working, uh, you're bored and you want to go to work as a Walmart door greeter or something of that nature, um, or a personal shopper or whatever, um, say you meet that cap on earnings. Um, we have the 2023 one because I don't believe it's out yet for 2024. I'm going to have to check on that. Um, but say you meet that 21,240 and you earn that from your um, Walmart job. If you are earning that FERS annuity supplement on your retirement, for every $2 you earn over that cap, your FERS annuity supplement is going to be reduced by a dollar. So just know that they're going to monitor that, that FERS annuity supplement. Um, earnings include wages, self-employment income, but nothing else. Income from severance pay, including the VSIP, any kind of pension, savings, investments, those are not subject to the earnings test. So basically, if you're working an extra job because you're bored or you need to go back to work um, because you just you need to have that income, um, if you make over that IRS or that, excuse me, that Social Security exempt amount, they're going to start reducing that FERS annuity supplement if you are receiving it. So there are <clears throat> there are a lot of retirement forms in the retirement packet. So we'd like to go over those. Um, all forms can be found on our website. You can use the GRB retirement application process by logging into the GRB platform retirement dashboard. That's an all electronic process similar to like a TurboTax like form filler. Um, however, if you decide to complete a um, hard copy of the retirement application, the first form you're going to need to complete is the standard form 3107. This is just the application for immediate retirement and is re a required form, obviously. Um, you, if you indicate you are married in Section B, Bravo, of the Standard Form 3107, you will also need to submit a copy of your marriage certificate. Additionally, you will need to complete the Schedule A and possibly B if you are former military, as well as the Schedule C if you have received injury compensation benefits within your federal civilian career. If you are choosing less than a full survivor annuity in Section D of the 3107, you will also need to complete the standard form 3107-2 and have your spouse sign that form in front of a notary public. This is an embedded form in the 3107, so it comes with it. You just need to find it. If you don't need it, just toss it or shred it, however you want to do it. Um, the standard form 2818, this is the continuation of life insurance coverage. This should be completed if you are currently enrolled in life insurance, regardless of if you wish to carry that life insurance benefit into retirement or not. Um, this is considered a legal and binding document. It declares your intent and it is required by OPM. So please, um, please know we're not forcing you to complete it. OPM has to have it on file. Please keep in mind every employee is enrolled in basic life insurance coverage when they first come on board. So if you've never waived your life insurance coverage, you most likely have it and will need to complete that form. <coughs> Excuse me. The W-4P is your election for federal tax withholding. It's important to complete, but not mandatory. If OPM receives a packet that does not contain the W-4P, it will adjust. It will just adjust your annuity federal withholding 
based upon OPM's tax guidelines, which is they'll they'll make you married with three exemptions. You're not locked into that. Once you're in the OPM system, you can go to services online and uh, make a make a change to that. So just know if you don't have that W-4P, they're going to just automatically put you in married with three exemptions. All active duty DD-214s, these should also be submitted with your packet, even if you're not buying back your military time. These are required documents by OPM to verify your military service. Um, if you've made a deposit for your military or civilian time during your federal service, it is important to provide the proof that of these deposits for the correct time to be credited. If you are retiring on a DSR or VERA option, you will need to provide the written notice of proposed involuntary separation for that DSR retirement or that VSIP agreement for your voluntary early retirement, if applicable. Please note if you make an error on any one of your forms necessary for retirement, <clears throat> you will need to complete that page or form. Uh, please visit the Army Benefit Center civilian website for more information on this process. So one of the most asked questions pertains to whether the Schedule A or B should be completed. Um, to determine this, you will need to refer to the Standard Form 3107, Section B, Bravo, questions four and five. If you answer yes on question four, you will also need to complete the Schedule A. If you answer yes to question five, you will also need to complete the Schedule B as this question pertains to military retired pay. Do not complete Schedule B if you answer no to question five, which Schedule B just pertains to military retired pay. So if you're not receiving it, Schedule B does not apply to you. So you just fill out Schedule A if you had military service like myself, I had eight years. So I just fill out Schedule A and that is it. I don't receive any kind of retirement pay, so I don't do B. But just remember to sign it at the bottom. So we'll go to the next one. Schedule B, again, the same questions apply to Schedule B. Question two pertains to military retired or retainer pay awarded for reserve service only. Answering yes to that question indicates you're at least 60 years of age and you meet the required retirement points to retire as a military reservist. Additionally, you would need to just attach a copy of your retirement award for that reserve retirement. If you are receiving military retirement pay due to serving 20 years in active duty service, you would answer question two, no, because you are not a retired reservist. <coughs> Hopefully that makes sense. <coughs> I'm sorry, starting to cough here. Oh, okay, unused sick leave. We did have some questions in the chat about this during break, so I'm going to try and cover this as best I can. If this does not answer your questions on that, please let us know. So any remaining annual leave you have when you retire is going to be paid out to you in a lump sum after your date of retirement. Um, unused sick leave, however, that is converted into days and months of service and then is added back to um, your length of service. So it, it counts for your eligibility and time. Well, it doesn't count for eligibility, but it counts for your retirement time. Um, the additional time added computes based on a 2,087 hour work year and it can increase your survivor annuity amount as well. For individuals who have transferred two FERS with a CSRS component, there's that component again, only the sick leave not included in the CSRS part of the calculation is going to be available under FERS. So again, you're penalized if you have that component and you're in FERS, it's not going to apply. Anything you earned in CSRS will not apply. <clears throat> So this is the sick leave chart that OPM uses to determine your sick leave conversion. Um, it is important to note one year is the equivalent, again, of 2,087 hours of sick leave, and anything beyond that amount is converted into months and days. For example, 986 hours, if you find 986 on the sick leave conversion chart, which is right here, if you can see that um, a little hand there, um, that converts to five months. You just go five months and 20 days. So five months and 20 days are gonna be added to your length of service. 
Your sick leave is noted on your LES, and it is important to note that when you're requesting a retirement estimate, your sick leave will be calculated into your length of service based upon the amount of sick leave you have at the time of the estimate. We do not project that out because sick leave is, is sick leave and annual leave are not something that we handle. Um, that is handled strictly by DFAS, and DFAS's portion of the retirement is is completed during that time when DFAS has your packet. So that's not something that we handle, but we like to tell you how it is converted. So computing the total service with your unused sick leave, um, this kind of just shows you a little, you know, a little example here. Um, you subtract your retirement service computation date, which you'll get when you um, have the estimate done. Um, you subtract that from your date of retirement. And then all dates should be listed in a four digit year, two digit month and two digit day format for computation. Once you've subtracted the retirement SCD, you will use the number of unused sick days found on your LES and the sick leave conversion chart to convert the hours into years, months and days and add that to your answer. So for this particular example, the person's date of retirement was 12-31-2020. Their retirement SCD was March 12th of 1990, which gave them 30 years, nine months, and 19 days of total service. But then they had this unused sick leave of 1136 hours. So you go out to the sick leave chart, you convert it. Um, if it's not an exact amount, you can round up or down. Um, and 1136 converted is six months and 16 days. So that gives this person 30 years, 15 months and 35 days. But since we need to convert it down to regular years, months and days, the total unused sick leave conversion computes to 31 years, four months and five days. So um, that's what their final total service will be. Um, when it comes time for their computation to be done for um, the annuity. So just know that um, that sick leave is used. We do, the only thing that we do is we drop off the days. If it doesn't equal 30 days, you're not going to get paid for it because your annuity is based on years and months. So um, you can compute it however you want. But again, this is something that we don't deal with on a regular basis. DFAS does your all of your leave and pay. So if you have questions about it, you can call their customer service and talk to them about it, but um, this is not something that we typically handle. So the high three average salary is another thing that comes into play um, with the annuity computation. This is a weighted average of the highest three years of basic pay. It includes any locality or local market supplement pay. The high three average salary is based upon three consecutive years and is usually the final three years you work for the federal government, but that's not always the case. Um, the high three, it's based upon the highest salary, not the highest grade, and it could be impacted by any locality pay. If your locality pay was higher, you know, say you worked in Maryland or Virginia, you know, in the middle of your career and you were at the same uh, GS level and step, and you move to Fort Riley, Kansas for the end of your career because that's where your husband went or you PCS or whatever, um, your locality pay is going to be a lot less. So they're going to take the highest salary amounts from any three year consecutive period. So just know that that is going to be looked at when we calculate the high three average salary. They will not um, not consider that. <clears throat> So the annuity computation, a lot of people ask about this for FERS. The formula for calculating your voluntary retirement is your high three average salary. You take that times 1% and then times your years and months of service. It's a pretty simple calculation when you can put everything into place. Um, if you are age 62 with at least 20 years of service, your calculation is going to be your high three average salary times 1.1% times your years and month of service. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot, 1% going from that to 1.1%, but if you have 30 years of service, it's gonna add up. Um, if you would like to know your current estimated annuity amount based upon your current high three, 
you can access that total um, compensation statement, the GRB platform. It's at the top of the left, uh, top left of the home page. Um, or you can go to the uh, new or the um, excuse me the estimate calculator as well um, and kind of look that over. It's going to give you a bird's eye view of what's there. Again, that SCD for leave may skew it a little bit, but um, it will it will give you a, a ballpark estimate, um, which will allow you for a more informed decision when it comes time to just planning for retirement. Um, please keep in mind for non-covered civilian positions and deposits for military service. They can affect this calculation at as it's based upon your service computation date for leave. I am sorry for the squeaking in the background. That is my puppy and I have I have to have her here because she'll go chew everything in the house. I apologize. <clears throat> um, let's go on to the next. So reductions and deductions. Uh, these pertain to the pre-tax and after-tax amount subtracted from your annuity. Reductions are completed uh, pre-tax and include MRA plus 10 age reductions, those deposit or redeposit under CSRS component reductions that we talked about, those 2% uh, reductions, and then any reductions for survivor benefit costs if you elect to receive a survivor annuity. Um, deductions are completed after taxes are taken out and include like your health and life insurance premiums and things of that nature. Um, this is a change from the typical pre-tax deductions during your federal civilian service, um, your federal tax and any federal long-term care insurance or dental or vision premiums. Those are also after-tax deductions as well if you're enrolled in those benefits. Um, it's really important to note we do not reflect taxes or any allotments for federal long-term care insurance, dental or vision insurance in those retirement. Hopefully you're still here. I uh, just lost electricity. I lost internet, everything. We still have some lightning in the area, so that's probably why. I hope nobody left. Um, so hopefully I didn't go on because I knew that everything disconnected, so hopefully everybody's still there. Um, 
so we're going to go on with survivor annuity elections. Um, survivor elections, these pertain to monies you wish to leave your spouse in the event of your passing. There are several elections and you must make at least one by initialing your chosen option in section D of the standard form 3107. Um, option one is shown here um, on the screen. This indicates you would like to leave a full survivor annuity to your spouse in the amount of 50% of your unreduced monthly annuity amount. Um, the cost associated with this option is 10% of your annuity each month. Um, option two, this indicates you would like to leave a partial annuity to your spouse in the amount of 25% of your unreduced annuity amount. The cost associated with this option is 5% of your annuity amount each month. It's really important to note if you wish to leave health benefits to your spouse after you pass away, you're going to need to elect either one of these two options, one or two. Any option selected that is less than that full survivor amount will require your spouse to complete the standard form 3107-2. It's called the spouse's consent to election form. Again, that is embedded in the application itself. OPM guidelines require your spouse to be notified and sign off on that election if it is less than that full survivor annuity. Then option three, this is choosing an annuity payable only during your lifetime. You should choose this option if you are unmarried or do not wish to leave a survivor annuity to your spouse. If you have an ex-spouse and you aren't sure whether he or she is court ordered to receive a portion of that annuity, um, you can also choose this option and include a copy of your divorce decree with your packet. OPM's legal team will review your divorce decree and automatically determine the amount per your court ordered documents. If you are currently
Okay, I am back. So I apologize for the um, delays. I am we're having lightning in the area, so I, my electricity keeps flickering on and off, which triggers my internet to go out. So I apologize for that. Um, it's kind of been this way all night. So um, we'll pick up. I did not um, go forward. We'll go ahead and pick up where I left off. Hey, stop. <clears throat> okay. So um, the survivor benefit cost and reduction. If a full survivor annuity is elected, 50% of your unreduced annuity amount is going to be paid to your spouse in the event of your passing and will cost that 10% of your monthly annuity amount while you're still living. Again, if you elect a partial survivor annuity, I'm going to go back to the previous slide because I want to make sure I cut wrong it's on this one. Um, so if you elect that partial survivor annuity, it's going to be 25% of your unreduced annuity amount when you pass away and it costs you 5% of your unreduced annuity amount while you're still living. Um, so for example, if you elect the full survivor annuity and your basic unreduced annuity is $12,000 per year, your yearly cost for the survivor annuity is $1,200 and your annual annuity amount would be $10,800 annually. So with a full survivor benefit, your survivor is going to receive $6,000 per year in the event of your passing. So that's the example, the first example. So if a partial survivor annuity is elected, and your annual unreduced annuity is $12,000 a year, your yearly cost for that partial survivor annuity is going to be $600, and your annual annuity amount would be $11,400 annually, or $950 per month. That's what you would receive um, before taxes. So with a partial survivor annuity, your survivor would receive $3,000 annually or 25% of your annuity in the event of your passing. So it's really important to note the health insurance cost is also going to be deducted from what your spouse will receive. So it's really best to verify your spouse will at least receive enough to cover that federal health benefit premium after you pass away. Other th otherwise, they'll be responsible for um, whatever the difference is. So you want to make sure that that's included in that survivor annuity. Oops, okay. So survivor benefit payments, these are payable for life unless the survivor remarries before the age of 55. And if that happens, um, benefits can be restored if that remarriage terminates in death annulment or divorce. So just so you know, um, the survivor annuity can continue as long as they do not remarry before age of 55 or if that remarriage terminates in death annulment or divorce. So disability retirement, <clears throat> you may qualify for disability retirement if you are unable to render useful and efficient service because of a disease or injury you might have had. You must be in a FERS covered position with a minimum of 18 months of creditable civilian service. It is important to note your disability annuity is subject to federal income tax and you are not eligible for that FERS annuity supplement should you retire with that disability retirement. So there are two different types of disability that pertains to disability retirement itself. So when you apply for OPM disability retirement, you must also apply with Social Security Disability or SSDI. And they're two different entities. So if you are approved by Social Security for the SSDI and you are under age 62 at separation, the first 12 months of your disability annuity is going to be calculated at 60% times your high three average salary, but it subtracts 100% of any Social Security benefits that you're going to receive um, or that you are receiving. So after that 12 months, that first 12 months has passed until you're age 62, your annuity is going to be calculated at 40% times your high three average salary minus 60% security disability benefits received. So they'll just offset that a little bit. Generally, it's more if you receive both, obviously, because you're receiving from two different entities. But um, 
just know that that can affect what OPM will give you. So the OPM disability retirement is going to be also recalculated at age 62 to an amount as if you had continued working until the day before your 62nd birthday and then just retired under an optional or voluntary retirement. So know that they will do that recomputation at age 62. So with the disability retirement, there are times when your annuity will be based upon the general FERS computation formula as opposed to the disability calculation itself. If you, <coughs> pardon me, if you are 62 years or older or meet age and service requirements for a regular unreduced immediate retirement, um, these are two of those instance, instances. For example, if you meet your minimum retirement age with 30 or more years of service or are eligible, or excuse me, or are age 60 with 20 or more years of service, um, your retirement will be calculated as a voluntary retirement because you meet that age and service requirement for the voluntary option. So just know that um, just because you want the disability at 62 years, you're eligible to, to go out on a voluntary retirement, they're going to calculate it as such. Um, so just know that they, they will not do a disability, they will put you over to a voluntary retirement in those two instances. So you must submit all forms for the regular retirement in addition to the standard form 3112 form series. Um, this includes four separate parts, standard form 3112 alpha or the applicant statement of disability. This is a brief statement written by you uh, and it just regards what your medical records state about your, the disability for which you're applying. Standard form 3112 Bravo or B is your for your supervisor to complete and, and sign. This must be completed and sent in to us in order to send that application forward to OPM. So if you have if you're um, having trouble getting that back from your supervisor, just give us a call. We might be able to um, give them a call and, and see if we can get it um, get it processed and signed and because um, it, it can hold up your packet a little bit. The standard form 3112 Charlie, this is the physician statement, which is merely a signed statement indicating you're aware OPM is going to review your personal medical records. Um, the standard form 3112 Delta, this is your agency certification of reassignment and accommodation efforts. Um, this form must be completed by your local human resources office, or if you still have that servicing CPAC, most of you don't, but whoever your agency HR is, um, it will be completed by them to determine, it, usually completed by the LMER, um, to determine what accommodations have been made regarding your disability. One important step again with that disability retirement is, is that you are required to apply for Social Security Disability Benefits or SSDI. Um, the FEDMER eligibility statement, you also have to complete that to indicate you have applied for Social Security Disability Benefits. If you already received that Social Security Disability Approval or Denial Notice, you will not need to complete the FEDMER statement. Just please provide a copy of your approval or denial letter in lieu of that FEDMER statement. That should suffice just fine. Death and service. Um, we're almost to a break. Uh, death and service is when an employee passes away while still an active federal civilian employee. As a result, your survivor may be entitled to certain survivor benefits. Um, in the event you do pass away while still in a federal civilian position, your supervisor should contact your servicing human resources representative or HRO, um, who will in turn contact the Army Benefits Center. And then an Army Benefit Center specialist will contact the survivor within 24 hour, hours of our notification when Army Benefit Center receives the notification from your HR. It's really important that your beneficiaries know this process in advance. No one wants to talk about passing away with their loved ones or any type of death or anything like that, but it does provide you a sense of peace to those involved, especially during a time of grief. Um, at the very least, you're providing your family with the contact information to our agency or your own agency or supervisor. That would be very helpful. Just write it down on a card and maybe attach it to your beneficiary forms and put it in the safe or safe deposit box and that way they know where to reference that. I've had to deal with death um, through the federal government and it, it is a long process but it's a quick process if you know where everything is. So um, just know 
um, that's very helpful, especially when you're grieving. So if you are married, there is a monthly spousal death benefit for those who were married at least nine months if the deceased had at least 10 years of creditable civilian service. Exceptions to that guideline include if the spouse is the parent of a child of the marriage or if the death was accidental. So um, those are two of the exceptions there. So children's uh, child's death benefit. So in the event of an active employee's passing, a child can also be eligible for a monthly benefit. Those benefits are payable to a child if the child is unmarried and under age 18. They're under age 22 and a full-time student, or if they're any age, if it was determined if the child was incapable of self-support before age 18. Um, the benefit is the same if the employee's death occurs while an active employee or if the employee is an annuitant and has retired from federal service. It's the same. So it's really important to ensure your beneficiary forms are always up to date. This is something I really like to hit home with people. I do give um, classes on this as well on occasion, and I think I've got some coming up this year. I'm just not quite sure what month I'm giving them in, um, but it'll be like a lunch and learn session. But OPM does have an order of precedence they follow to determine who will receive your money if that beneficiary form is not on file. So the order of precedence, and you can see it on the right hand side, it's the court order. That's always going to trump any kind of um, beneficiary form, anything. A court order will always do that. Um, but there are now three types of beneficiary forms. So the standard form 1152 for unpaid compensation. This is going to pertain to your final paycheck or any unpaid annual leave you may have um, have had at the time of your passing. And then once you pass away, of course, all your payments are going to stop. You're going to be um, taken out of the DFAS system and they're going to have any unpaid compensation. Um, anything that they still have on the books, that's going to be paid out to whomever you designate as the beneficiary on the 1152 form. The standard form 2823, this is to determine who receives your life insurance, the FEGLI. Um, the standard form 3102, this pertains to, <laughs> excuse me, to your accumulated FERS retirement contributions. Um, to designate a beneficiary for your accumulated thrift savings plan contributions, they don't they no longer have a form. You have to visit the TSP.gov portal to complete that beneficiary process electronically. And the link is there on this slide as well. Um, each form is going to require two witnesses who are not listed as beneficiaries prior to certification. Um, completed standard forms 1152, 2823, 3102. This should all be taken to um, excuse me, this has changed since I've last done this, but they should all be mailed to the Army Benefit Center. Um, you can take them to, if you have an agency HR personnel or an agency HR office, um, you can kind of do a one-stop shop, so to speak, as the office can provide those two witnesses to your signature, certify the form, and then upload it to EOPF. If you want to do it that way and you have that opportunity, I would do it that way. It's the fastest way. Or you can, like I said, mail or email those to the Army Benefit Center civilian. We can certify the form and upload to the EOPF, but we cannot provide those witnesses to your signature. Once again, that TSP3 form no longer exists. Um, you must name your beneficiaries electronically at tsp.gov. If you require assistance with any of those forms, you can also contact us at the phone center um, or visit our website. We do have a um, uh, resources tab on for beneficiary forms and things of that nature. So um, that is on our website. So when you retire, the active employee general pay adjustments, those are referred to as cost of living adjustments or COLAs. COLAs are based upon increases in the consumer price index. Um, these adjustments are effective December 1st each year, and you will see that increase in pay beginning with your January annuity payment. So um, just know that may come in February because I think they always pay you I think the pay ends up that way. January payment is in February, February is in March. Um, 
Also, it's important to note that for those cost of living adjustments, you must be 62 years of age or older to receive those. However, disability and any survivors, um, those they receive cost of living adjustments at any age. Um, I think for 2023, it was 8.7%. I think it's, I want to say it's like 5.4% or something this year. Um, so I'll get that changed and updated to make sure that you are aware. NAF service. So if you have previous NAF service, you may be eligible under NAF to receive retirement benefits. And that occurs if you have previous non-appropriate offender NAF service and you retained your NAF retirement. Um, the Army Benefits Center does not unfortunately process employees under the NAF retirement system. You have to contact your nearest NAF office to inquire about those benefit options. Um, if you have that prior NAF service, but you elected to change over to FERS coverage when you move to the appropriated fund side, you will contact the Army Benefits Center regarding your retirement. So it's important to know where you fall on that spectrum. It's very important also to note if you are retiring and immediately being rehired in say maybe a NAF position or transferring to another federal employment or being rehired as a reemployed annuitant, you must notify the Army Benefits Center before your retirement is processed. You can leave a little note on your retirement packet, let them know, hey, I'm getting rehired as a reemployed annuitant right after I go. Um, right after I retire. So that what that does is it works to prevent an erroneous payout of your lump sum annual leave after you retire. So if that lump sum annual leave is paid out and you're rehired in any of those circumstances, the lump sum payment then becomes a debt for which you'll be required to pay back the government because they're going to reinstate your leave. So just know um, the sooner we know, the easier it is for us to just flick the switch that says, do not pay this person the annual leave payout and um, your leave will continue. It will just continue as your reemployed annuitant. All right, so we are going to take a break. I apologize again for all of the delays. Um, let's take a, a quick 10 minute break, um, stretch your legs, that's a lot of information, and then we'll continue on with benefits and um, knock this thing out and get it all done. Hopefully we're getting your questions answered. I'm gonna continue to answer questions during the break. Um, Enjoy your time to think.
OK, y'all, let's start this uh, last little bit of the briefing and get this done so we can get you out of here. It is, gosh, it's been an eventful day <laughs> and I've had little sleep, so I do apologize if I'm going too fast or too slow or going into the weeds a little bit, but um, we do need to go into the weeds a little bit regarding your federal benefits and how they relate to retirement. So the first one we're gonna review and probably most common is the federal employee health benefit. Um, the federal government does currently offer three options for FEHB plans. They are the self only, uh, self plus one, and then the self and family. Uh, because the Army Benefit Center does not manage each health plan's details specifically, you would need to visit the website on the screen for more information on the various health plans, or you can search the word healthcare at opm.gov and it will bring up um, the FEHB plan comparison tool. It's really a useful tool out there and it does kind of spell out the details of the various plans offered to you based upon your location. Oops. Okay. All right, so there are several criteria you must meet in order to carry your FEHB plan into retirement. Um, first, you must retire on an immediate annuity. So that just means that you are eligible to retire and uh, you're going out on that voluntary option. Um, you must also be covered by an FEHB plan on the date of your retirement. You have to be covered up to that point at least. Um, if you're going to take it into retirement, you're going to continue to be retired or going to continue to be covered. Um, third, you must be covered in an eligible FEHB plan for at least five years of service prior to retirement, five consecutive years, or be covered in a plan since your first opportunity to enroll. Now, your first opportunity to enroll in FEHB is going to play a special role in situations such as the voluntary early retirement or the discontinued service retirement. That can be discussed, uh, that'll be discussed in detail on the next slide. Now, coverage as a family member under your spouse's um, FEHB plan, if you're dual uh, federal civilian uh, careers, or if you are covered under TRICARE or even a VA plan, that does count toward that five-year requirement, but you must be enrolled in an FEHB plan prior to retirement and provide that eligibility statement from your plan administrator. So just know that um, TRICARE and VA
I am so very sorry. This stinking weather system is about ready to drive me nuts. Um, so anyway, well, let's try and push through this. <laughs> so let's start over with this slide. So there are several criteria you have to meet to carry that FEHB plan into retirement. First, again, you must retire on an immediate annuity. That's going to mean that your retirement must be optional or voluntary, and you must meet those age and time and service requirements. You must be eligible. Um, you must also be covered by an FEHB plan on the date of your retirement. And then thirdly, you must be covered in an eligible FEHB plan for the five years of service prior to retirement or be covered in a plan since your first opportunity to enroll in the coverage. Um, your first opportunity to enroll in FEHB, it's going to play a special role in situations such as a voluntary early retirement or that discontinued service retirement. That's going to be discussed in detail on the next slide. Um, again, coverage as a family member under your spouse's FEHB for those dual federal civilian uh, families or under TRICARE or a VA plan, that does count toward the five-year requirement, but you must be enrolled in an FEHB plan prior to retirement to provide an eligible, and, and you've got to provide that eligibility statement, of course, from your TRICARE or VA uh, plan administrator. Um, just know that um, enrollment in that FEHB plan prior to retirement is, is, uh, is, you have to do that. So um, you'll have to pick that up in open season and carry it that last year or, you know, whenever that happens. So um, if you need more information on that, you can definitely look a uh, five-year test up on opm.gov. They do have more information on that um, eligibility requirement. Oh, wait. Why is this? Okay, I'm hoping you're seeing my slides. Everything is just kind of went haywire. Okay, so those early retirement waivers for the um, VERA and DSR options. Um, there's only one way you can obtain a waiver for that five-year FEHB requirement, and that is if you are retiring under one of those. Um, first, you must be enrolled in an FEHB plan on the first day of the Voluntary Early Retirement Authority buyout period that will be listed on all of your paperwork, and you must retire during that buyout period. Um, you can get the waiver of that five-year FEHB requirement. You must also be receiving a VSIP payment. Um, you have to retire again on that early optional retirement because of that early out authority or retire on that discontinued service retirement based on involuntary separation due to a re reduction in force. Um, if you meet those criteria, you're interested in that pre-approved waiver for your VERA DSR retirement, please give us a call at the Army Benefits Center, or you can visit uh, the website and contact us through those email inquiry boxes as well. The cost of FEHB plan in retirement is the same as that of an active federal employee. The government does continue to pay their portion. Um, the only difference is the premiums are paid monthly versus a biweekly basis. Um, the same open season and qualifying life event opportunities or QLEs, those exist for annuitants, and the same FEHB plans are going to be available to you. Um, retirement itself is not a qualifying life event for making a change to your FEHB enrollment. Um, a lot of people think that it is, but it is not. If you plan to cancel your FEHB plan in retirement, please keep in mind you will not have another opportunity to re-enroll at any point in time. Um, at age 65, enrollment in Medicare is optional to you. However, once you are enrolled in Medicare, it does become your primary coverage and your FEHB plan becomes your secondary coverage. <coughs> Now, suspension, this is something um, that is offered to you rather than canceling your FEHB coverage in retirement and not having an option to pick it back up. Um, retirees can choose to suspend their FEHB to use things like TRICARE or CHAMP VA, Medicaid, Medicare, um, any federal or state sponsored program. Medicare Advantage, Medicare Part C, um, instead of canceling the FEHB coverage. Um, if you involuntarily lose the non-FEHB coverage for some reason, or you would like to pick the coverage up again during an open season event, you can do so with an FEHB suspension at retirement. 
As an annuitant, you do not participate in that premium conversion or for your health care premiums. And additionally, your spouse is eligible to continue coverage after your death, but only if you have them covered at the time of your passing and you elect to provide a survivor benefit at retirement, either that full or partial uh, survivor annuity. If you wish to participate with that or in that suspension, you can fill out the RI-79-9. There is a downloadable copy on our website and on opm.gov as well. Um, you will also need to provide a copy of the ID that permits the, cover the additional coverage, like your TRICARE ID or your VA ID, Medicaid, any whatever it is, uh, front and back. Um, people can also... Um, I believe there's an eligibility letter. TRICARE um, will allow you to, um, it's kind of an electronic thing you put in for the eligibility letter. They will give you that. That will also help, but you have to have that TRICARE ID front and back as well to uh, take, to uh, be able to participate in that suspension. Medicare. Um, this is something we don't do a lot with. Um, this is another class that I'll have later on in the year. Um, I'm going to kind of dive into it a little bit more because I don't know a lot about it, but I'm going to educate myself and hopefully educate other people as well. Um, we don't handle issues, advisement or enrollment pertaining to Medicare typically, but we do like to provide just a small overview of the information for those who are not familiar with it. Um, Medicare does have four parts. Medicare Part A covers you for hospitalization and is of no cost to you. Upon age 65, you will receive a letter from Medicare to enroll in Part A because it is free. Medicare Part B is for medical benefits. There's a monthly premium associated with coverage under Part B that is based on your yearly adjusted gross income. Um, Medicare Part C is generally referred to as Medicare Advantage and is offered by a private company. This does have a premium associated with it as well. And then Medicare Part D is associated with prescription drug costs and also has a monthly premium associated with it. There are various plans associated with that Part D coverage, but for more information on Medicare itself, I would contact your local Medicare or Social Security agency to make an appointment. Uh, specialists there can go over everything with you, um, especially if you've had a retirement estimate done. It's really um, important to kind of understand how Social Security and your annuity and TSP and all that kind of um, overlap each other. So um, you can definitely make an appointment with them, take your estimate in there, and uh, they will go over everything with you and kind of get you straight as far as how Social Security becomes involved with your annuity, how Medicare becomes involved with your annuity. Well, there we go. All right, Fagley. So the next benefit is the Federal Employees Group Life Insurance. Um, for more information on this topic, you can visit opm.gov or you can give them a call at their toll-free number and they will be happy to help you. There are several criteria that govern your ability to continue your Fagley into retirement, which are like that of your health benefits. You must be retiring on an immediate annuity and must be insured on the date of your retirement. The biggest difference is with that five-year rule. There is no option or waiver for your five-year rule with Fagley. You must be enrolled in each option and the number of multiples that you wish to carry for the five years prior to retirement or since your first opportunity to enroll. If you carry Fegley at the time of retirement, you must complete that standard form 2818, that continuation of life insurance, regardless of whether you elect to continue your coverage or not. It's just a, it's an election form, states whether or not you want the coverage and OPM requires it. All federal employees are enrolled again in basic Fagley coverage when they first come on board in a covered position. If you've never waived that Fagley coverage, you most likely at least carry basic um, which will require you to complete that standard form 2818. Um, if you're unsure of your coverage, you can also check out block 27 of your most recent SF50. That contains the information as does the EBATS icon that's accessible via the ABCC website. <coughs> so we're gonna look at basic life insurance options only. 
right now. We're going to leave the multiples and the and the optional on the side. So we're going to look at basic. Um, for basic vaguely coverage, your basic insurance amount, it's sometimes called a BIA. Um, this is based on your annual salary, rounded up to the nearest thousand, and then adding $2,000 to that. So for example, an employee whose base salary is $51,464, it's rounded up to 52,000 and then you add another 2,000 to it, bringing the basic insurance amount to 54,000. So when an employee elects to retire, there are three options that um, you can choose for basic insurance coverage. So we're gonna use our example, the $54,000 of basic insurance, um, the 75% reduction, that's the first, um, the first um, option, excuse me, um, so using that above example, the 75% reduction prior to age 65, that's going to have a cost of $18.72 per month for just that basic coverage at that 75% reduction. After age 65, the cost for the 75% reduction coverage just disappears. It, it goes away. You won't pay a premium. And then the basic insurance amount begins to reduce by 2% per month until just 25% of the basic insurance amount remains. So the amount paid to your beneficiaries in this case would equal 25% of that basic insurance amount or $13,500 if we use the example uh, BIA that we talked about. The second option is a 50% reduction. This would cost you $59.22 per month prior to age 65 and it would reduce to $40.50 per month at age 65. After age 65, that coverage begins to decrease by 1% per month until 50% of that basic insurance amount remains. The amount paid to your beneficiaries will equal 50% of your basic insurance amount or $27,000 if we use our example. Lastly, there is a no reduction option. That is exactly as it sounds. Using our example, you would pay $140.22 per month prior to age 65 and $121.50 per month after age 65. The amount paid to your beneficiaries does not reduce and it would pay out at the amount of your basic insurance coverage at the time of retirement. So if we use our example, your beneficiary or your beneficiaries are going to receive $54,000 at the time of your passing. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of what those three options are, because that can be confusing on that form. <clears throat> The standard form 2818 for basic life insurance elections will need to be completed, again, regardless of whether you plan to carry your Fagley coverage into retirement or not. Um, we're going to go over this form or, uh, section by section. If you meet the qualifying criteria as discussed previously, you will have the option to carry that basic coverage into retirement. So question seven of the form is pictured here. It pertains to whether you wish to continue carrying the basic life insurance. Um, if you received a living benefit, you would mark the form accordingly and just skip to question nine. If you wish to continue your basic life insurance, you will mark what option you wish to elect, 75% reduction, 50% reduction, or no reduction. And that is in question eight, based on what we just talked about in the previous slide. And again, you'll have these slides um, emailed to you, so it's you can kind of go over it a little bit more with a fine tooth comb and, and make it understand it a little bit better. I know we're covering things quickly. So now we're going to go into optional coverage. Let's cover options. Uh, option A. So option A is basically just a standard coverage of an additional $10,000. So as you mature in age, that cost does increase based on your age. Um, option A does carry a premium until age 65, but after age 65, there is no cost to you. So at age 65, that coverage is going to start reducing by that 2% per month until just 25% of that $10,000 or $2,500 remains, and that's what would be paid out to your beneficiary. So the 2818 and option A, those elections for retirement are made on question nine of the standard form 2818. If you meet the criteria for Fagley coverage and retirement mentioned previously, you will mark yes or no. However, if you do not have option A coverage at the time of retirement, 
you would mark, I do not have option A. Please do not mark no, because if you do that, we have to have you recomplete the entire form. Um, if you don't have option A, or if you're not sure if you have it, visit the eBATS on, uh, link on or the icon on um, our website, or check your SF50s to make sure um, what you do or don't have. Um, if you don't have option A, please just mark, I don't have option A, don't just select no. It's really important you do that. This form is, they're very, very picky about this, and we kind of cover that in a submitting a healthy retirement packet briefing, but it's really important that we get this right and um, get it sent in right the first time. <clears throat> so option B coverage. This is unique in the sense that it allows you to elect one through five multiples of your basic salary rounded up to the nearest thousand. So in our previous example, the employee can elect one to five multiples of his or her base salary of that $52,000. <clears> Again, the coverage is for the employee and it would be paid to his or her beneficiaries in the event of their passing. So this coverage does increase in cost with age. The cost shown on the slide for option B is per thousand in the middle column and per our example in the far right column. So our example shows the election of one, just one multiple of option B and the cost at age 80 for that one multiple of $52,000 is more than $300 per month. So if two multiples were elected, it would double the premium amount to $648.96 a month and provide $104,000 worth of coverage. Some people call this the Fagley trap, um, and they think that they're going to get it for the same price that they had it when they were an employee. That is not the case. It does get very costly, so please um, take the time to pursue other options and see if you can get it cheaper. Um, it does it does get quite costly um, when you're looking at option B. And for some people, option B is the meat and potatoes of their, their life insurance. So um, just know that it, it can get costly, so it is good to pursue um, any other options that you might have. So option B elections for retirement, these are made on questions 10 and 11 of the standard form 2818. There are two different options to choose from. The full reduction option begins to reduce coverage at age 65 by 2% per month for 50 months, at which time that coverage is just gonna end. But there is no cost to that at age 65. Once that starts reducing, the premium is going to end. So if you choose that full reduction option, there's no premium at age 65 and you'll get that reduction. <coughs> Excuse me. The no reduction option continues the coverage throughout retirement as well as the premium. So if you meet the criteria to carry option B into retirement, you will mark yes or no on question 10. If you do not have option B coverage at the time of retirement, just mark I do not have option B on question 10 and move on. Uh, question 11 is going to pertain to the number of full or no reduction multiples you plan to carry into retirement. Keep in mind, this can be any mixed number of eligible multiples. So for example, I carry five multiples of option B. I can choose to carry maybe four full reduction multiples and maybe one no reduction multiple. I can choose to carry three full reduction multiples and leave the other two behind. Um, I can choose to carry five no reduction multiples. It's whatever you choose. If you are eligible for that number of multiples, you can make up whatever you want to do. You can do full and no reduction multiples. You can do all full, all no. It just depends on what you want to do. So <clears throat> option C, Fagley coverage. Um, this is for your spouse and eligible children up to age 22. Spousal coverage is $5,000 per, per multiple of coverage, and then each eligible child is covered for $2,500 per multiple. Um, you can choose up to the five multiples of coverage, and that covers any number of eligible family members. Please keep in mind, you still have to be eligible for the multiples and option C, so you have to meet that eligibility criteria. So there is no proof needed to elect option C when you first come on board unless a death occurs and then you'll have to you'll turn in the birth certificate and the death certificate. Um, as the employee does mature in age, the cost for option C does increase. 
So using our previous example, that slide shows premium amounts for one multiple of coverage. If you had five multiples, you would just need to multiply the monthly premium by five. So um, that kind of gives you through um, through the years and age group um, what it does go up to. And it isn't too costly. So if you're carrying that five multiples, that might be something worth carrying into retirement. <clears throat> Much like option B, you'll be able to elect a full or no reduction for each multiple. Full reduction multiples are of no cost to you after age 65, and that amount of coverage is going to begin reducing at 2% per month until that coverage just ends, similar to the option B. No reduction, the no reduction option, that continues the coverage and the premiums throughout retirement. Um, if you meet the criteria for option C eligibility into retirement, you will indicate whether you wish to continue this coverage on question 12 of that form um, and then the number of full or no reduction multiples you wish to carry into retirement on question 13. Again, this can be any mixed number of eligible multiples. If you do not have option C coverage at the time of retirement, please don't just mark no. Um, on question 12, please just mark, I do not have option C. This is a form that we cannot help you correct. You have to correct it yourself because it has to be signed by you. So um, this is something that it can be frustrating for employees if they're not aware. So um, we just wanna make you aware of all those requirements. TSP, we're getting close. Um, your thrift savings plan or TSP elections, those are partially completed through the Army Benefits Center. However, you're going to also interact with the thrift savings plan agency directly for certain specific issues regarding your TSP fund. Um, they manage those funds. So um, I did include the mailing address, phone center hours. Their hours of operation are very generous, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern. And um, also they have a chat bot now that you can use and it is very handy. I've used it a couple times. So the TSP program is the federal civilian employees equivalent of a 401k program. This allows for the government to match individual contributions up to 5%. Your TSP provides you two tax treatment options for your contributions. You have the traditional TSP or pre-tax contribution and tax deferred investment contributions. Those are withdrawn from your pre-taxed paycheck. So that does give you a little tax savings there. Or you have the Roth TSP or after tax where those contributions are taken from your paycheck after those taxes have already been deducted. The good thing about Roth contributions is that they pay the tax up front, so your retirement withdrawal is not taxed at the time you do withdraw it. Um, TSP provides the opportunity to increase your retirement income, but you must be in a position subject to retirement deductions in order to contribute. Um, TSP should be, again, the largest portion of your retirement income in that three-tiered uh, pyramid we, we showed you on the slide. Um, because those contributions are, are, are those that you make and you determine, and then the matching the federal government contributes on your behalf adds to it. TSP offers two approaches to investing your money, and that's the various life cycle funds. We kind of went over those early on in the briefing. Um, these are invested across a diverse mix of your individual funds, or you have the individual funds themselves, the G, F, C, S, and I funds, which allow you to invest your contributions how you choose between those in individual funds. And for explanations about all of those, the life cycle, G, F, C, S, and I funds, um, there is a, an explanation page on the tsp.gov website. It's on the home page, and if you go up to, I think it's like, managing your TSP account or something like that. It, it will tell you all about each of the funds if you're interested. Some people like to look into that, so I always like to put that out there. TSP does have different options to withdraw your TSP contributions at retirement, but you must begin receiving at least the minimum distribution by April 1st after the year you turn 73 years of age or in the year you separate from civilian, federal civilian service, whichever is later. Um, you can visit tsp.gov for more information on that. TSP Makeup is a program that allows employees called to active military duty on absent U.S. or LWOP U.S. Um, to become eligible to make up missed civilian TSP contributions if you meet certain criteria. 
Um, if you were placed in absent U.S. or separated from federal civilian service to perform military service, um, you were released from active duty service on or after August 2nd, 1990, and then reemployed in or restored to a position covered by CSRS or FERS, you may request to make up your missed civilian TSP contributions when you were on active duty. Please keep in mind this request has to be done within 60 days of the date you return to your civilian position. So you can't go back and do it for things that you've had years ago, but we like to put the information out there for those of you that are young and, and just coming into the federal service um, to let you know that that is available to you. You can go, um, there's a link there to the TSP makeup process under the how do I section on our website. It is very helpful if you choose to participate. TSP catch up and spillover. Um, this is open to TSP participants turning age 50 or older. Um, if this applies to you, then you probably received your email recently. I know I did. Um, you no longer have to sign up for catch up each year due to their new spillover method that's in place. The spillover method does apply to all catch up contributions and just kind of helps simplify the catch up program for both participants and their servicing agencies. Um, under the new spillover method, you no longer must make annual catch up elections in GRB. Instead, those TSP contributions continue until participants reach that annual elective deferral amount, which is $23,000 for 2024. Um, if a participant is eligible to make those catch up contributions, you're over 50 or turning age 50 or older um, in the year. Anything beyond that elective deferral limit of 24,000 or 20, excuse me, $23,000 will automatically spill over toward the annual catch up contribution limit, which is $7,500 for this year until you meet the annual combined contributions cap, which is $30,500. Um, contribution spillover toward catch up will be matched, but only up to the 5% of salary contributions to which you're already entitled. So you can visit uh, tsp.gov and search bulletin 20-1. There is a really helpful, um, just an article on the spillover process and how all of that works if you need to have if you have questions or you need more information on that. Long-term care insurance and flexible spending accounts. <coughs> Long-term care insurance and the flexible spending account are two civilian benefits that are managed by a third-party contractor. What this means for you is you will need to access these agencies directly for enrollment and any questions you might have regarding the various plan information. Um, new enrollments for long-term care insurance were suspended indefinitely in December of 2022. I think they're revamping the program, but they plan to bring it offline. It's either gonna be December 2024 or 2025. Their website does give you more information. So if you're interested, um, you can monitor that at ltcfeds.com. Flexible spending account information can be found at fsafeds.com. Uh, retirees, unfortunately, are not eligible to continue participation in the flexible spending accounts after they retire. And before you retire, you must use all your contributions prior to retirement or you will forfeit them. So just know that if you have money left in that FSA before you retire, you need to spend it. So otherwise it'll just go in their pot. So um, we wanna make sure that um, you're aware of that. FedVIP, this is the Federal Dental and Vision Insurance Program. These are also managed by a third party contractor and different rules do apply to this benefit when you take that into retirement. Um, unlike your health benefit, there is no five year enrollment requirement for the federal dental and or vision benefit. This does make it possible to enroll after you retire, even if you never enrolled during your federal civilian service. As long as you were eligible to enroll in FEHB, you can pick up the dental and vision. You may enroll in dental and vision, uh, dental or vision insurance, or you can take both benefits. Um, to enroll in those, you would just uh, give them a call toll free, or you can visit benefeds.com. 
Retirement estimates. Um, if you are within, again, five years of being eligible for retirement, you may request a retirement estimate from the Army Benefit Center. These retirement estimates do include verification of your military and civilian service as documented in your electronic personnel folder. Um, the estimate also calculates the amount of civilian deposit and or redeposit you might owe if you have one that you're, you're eligible to make. And it reviews the impact of any unpaid military or civilian deposits or redeposits and how that may impact your retirement annuity. It also includes a confirmation of current health and life insurance benefits and provides information on your eligibility to continue both of those benefits into retirement. And it also um, calculates that retirement SCD, the coveted retirement SCD. Um, to request that retirement estimate, you can visit the GRB platform and select requests from that main dashboard in the upper left-hand corner. That is the only request you can make at this time. So you just fill out, you, the, you follow the prompts there and um, they'll get that in. I'm not sure of the time frame. It was six months. Um, they were having a hard time getting things uh, completed because of the number of retirements they had in-house. So it might be taking longer than that now. I am not sure. That is something you would definitely have to call um, to find out, or you can you can do use the email inquiry box as well. Retirement timeline. Okay, so there are several things you can do to make that retirement process a little easier when that time arrives. So that five years prior to retirement, again, we highly recommend you contact us to get that retirement estimate going and follow up with any questions you might have about the information that we provide. 180 days prior to retirement, you will need to complete that retirement packet either by printing off those forms, doing the hard copy, um, you can print them from our website, or you can use the GRB platform retirement application process that can be found in the GRB retirement dashboard. Um, should you need assistance with completing anything in those forms, you can contact the Army Benefit Center with any questions, and a specialist would be happy to assist you. Um, if you choose to submit a pen and ink copy of the retirement packet, you will mail all forms to the Re Army Benefit Center. 90 to 120 days prior to retirement. Maintain a personal copy for your records, as with anything in the federal government or the military. Always maintain a personal copy. It is important to only submit the packet one time, either electronically via the GRB platform or the hard copy packet through the mail. Please do not submit both ways. What's gonna happen is that whenever that first one came in, whenever we get the second one, it's gonna bump you back in the processing queue to whenever we receive the second copy. So we don't want your place in the processing queue to be skewed. So just, if you have questions or you think you filled something out incorrectly, or you need to re, um, redo a form, and you you only did the hard copy packet, give us a call and um, we can help you get that connected to your retirement application. So it's important to also provide a good address and contact information for where you're going to reside after your retirement on that retirement application. <coughs> Excuse me. There are several items that will be sent to you through postal mail by OPM. So that current mailing address is always beneficial. Um, once your application is received at the Army Benefits Center, you're going to receive an automated email notification. So another important reminder is to provide a home email address on your application. Um, I cannot stress this enough. So after you turn in that common access card, you no longer have ad access to your work email address. So you don't want that on your retirement application in case we have to process after your date of retirement. We need a way and OPM needs a way to get a hold of you after your retirement. So it's really important to provide us that personal address as there will be correspondence that arrives to your account via email. Due to an OPM retirement process update and enforcement, the employee must also review and sign their respective standard form 3107-1, which is the certified summary of federal service. This form is completely uh, completed by the Army Benefits Center, and it's sent to you for review and signature after the packet is completed. Um, basically, it's a verification of all of your um, where you've worked, um, your military time, and all of that. So um, you can sign that 
you have to review it and sign it within a five day window. Return that uh, the sign form to the Army Benefit Center. You can either fax it, you can upload it to the document upload tool in GRB. If you've submitted electronically, that works too. So um, you may sign with either your CAC certificate signature or wet ink signature, and you can return again via GRB platform document upload tool. You can email it to the inquiry box, you can fax it, or you can return it by postal mail. Not reviewing this document and signing in a timely manner can delay your placement in an interim pay status with OPM because we have to have that signed by you. If it is not, they will delay processing your packet at OPM. So we wanna make sure that that is signed and ready to go um, just as soon as possible after we've processed our portion. So the three agencies. So the Army Benefit Center role in the retirement process begins 30 to 60 days prior to your selected retirement date. Regardless of when you submitted that retirement packet, that's when we start processing your packet. So you may have had it there for a year. We're not gonna start until it's 30 to 60 days out from your selected retirement date. Please keep in mind this is in a perfect world and things are going great and our production is not off the chart. Our production levels are not off the charts. So um, <clears throat> at that time, between that 30 and 60 days, your retirement packet is going to be assigned to a benefit specialist, at which time you will receive another email. Once it's, once it's assigned, you're just going to receive an automated email. Uh, the benefit specialist will then verify the packet to ensure the required forms and documents have been received and that they are completed correctly. If they find something that needs to be um, corrected or they find a form that's missing or a document that's missing, they will reach out to you via email or by phone to let you know. Um, once the packet is, is deemed healthy per OPM guidelines, referring back to that benefits um, administration letter that we talked about early on in the brief, that retirement packet will then be processed and you will receive your final retirement counseling and final retirement estimate. This can come either by phone or email. So again, an email, very, very important that we have a place to get a hold of you after your retirement date. So um, we know where to find you. Work email, don't ever put that on there because that just, it makes things really difficult for us. So after the packet is complete and we've completed our portion at the Army Benefit Center and given you your final retirement counseling and your estimate, it's then going to travel to the Defense Finance and Accounting Service or DFAS where it's processed and then will be forwarded on to OPM for final adjudication. So during that process, once DFAS receives your packet, you will be separated from the DFAS pay system and the Thrift Savings Plan Agency will be notified of your retirement and separation from the federal government. Um, during this time, you will receive your final paycheck from your agency and a lump sum payment for any unused annual leave. That process can take anywhere from two to three pay periods after DFAS receives your packet. Um, if you are owed a voluntary separation incentive payment or severance pay, um, you will also receive this at that time according to your election on that VSIP um, election form. DFAS comply, uh, compiles your pay history record and it forwards your retirement packet and your pay history records to OPM when it's complete. So they kind of put everything together and we do the work history side, they do the pay side and it all goes forward. Once OPM receives the information from DFAS and the Army Benefits Center, you will then be placed in the interim payment system for OPM and your civil service annuitant or CSA number and the letter from OPM is mailed to your address on the application. So hence the reason why we need a way to reach you by mail after your, or after your retirement date. This indicates you are now in the OPM system once you receive that CSA letter and they become your benefits and finance center. Everything is centrally located within OPM. Any questions pertaining to benefits or finance may be addressed with OPM using your CSA number. You may contact OPM by using the email retire at opm.gov at any time, even when you're a federal civilian employee, or by phone at 888-767-6738.
If you have questions about your Social Security or Medicare benefits, please contact the Social Security Administration or visit ssa.gov or medicare.gov. Those websites are very helpful. Additionally, ABC does not handle issues regarding taxes or tax advisement. Um, we would refer you to the irs.gov website or your state treasurer's office for re questions regarding any kind of tax issues. Agency contact information. These are your post-retirement contacts listed here that we just went over. Changing or withdrawing. We're almost there, folks. Um, once you have submitted your retirement packet, you may request to change your date of retirement or withdraw your packet completely. Your request to change the date or withdraw your packet must be completed in writing, and it must be signed by you and faxed to Army Benefits Center. If you are within 30 days of your scheduled retirement, you must also have um, an HRO, an, an HR official or an HR office uh, specialist sign um, the form. There is a place for them to sign on that form, and those forms are available on our website at the link there on the slide. Um, if you've recently been offered a VERA or VSIP and already have a retirement in-house, please provide the VERA and VSIP paperwork to our office via fax or email. Uh, VERA VSIP changes will also require that, uh, that form that we talked about, the change form, um, and require that HRO's signature as well. Um, regardless of the date change request is sent to Army Benefit Center, we still have to have that form. It is always best to submit your request to the Army Benefit Center as soon as you've made the decision to change the date. Um, changing or withdrawing your retirement can cause problems with your paycheck, so it's very important to submit your request to Army Benefit Center as soon as you've made the decision to change your date. For additional information, you may contact the Army Benefits Center in various ways. Please visit our website for the most recent agency-specific contact information by selecting the Contact Us tab on our homepage. Our call center is open Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time, except for federal holidays and due to inclement weather, um, sometimes we do uh, have 100% telework during those times. Um, today is one of those times. Uh, you may access our website at abc.chara.army.mil. And our mailing address is also listed there. You can connect with us on social media at Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and YouTube. And we have reached the end. Thank you for your patience and for sticking around today. This disc does conclude the briefing. We have covered so much ground, and we want to thank you for joining us and, and staying with us um, through all the technicality and the difficulties. And for the opportunity to provide this information, because it's really important as you move closer to retirement. Um, we will stick around for a few extra minutes to answer questions and finish those up in the live Q&A chat feature. If you think of any questions after the Q&A session is closed, please don't hesitate. You can email me directly again. Um, you can use our contact information on the website to reach out to us as well. On behalf of the Army Benefit Center Civilian and Ms. Marie Shelton, thank you so much. We want to thank you all for your service to our great nation. We look forward to assisting you in the future.